One, two, one, two, one, two. All praises to the Most High. Shalom, brothers and sisters. Shalom to the brothers and sisters here in the congregation of Gastonia. Most High in Christ bless you. Uh, happy Sabbath. Glad to be here. Also want to say shalom to my brothers and sisters that are following online. All praise to the Most High. Glad that the Lord has spared our lives and have given us uh, acceptable help. That acceptable health where we could uh, continue to uh, endure in his word. We ask for the Lord to give us even better health so that we can continue to endure. Because we have a lot of road ahead of us in terms of reaching our goal, which is the kingdom of God. Um, today's topic is war in heaven and earth. War in heaven and in earth. Now, that title has you can go you can go several ways with it in terms of its name war in heaven then you say war in earth but what does that mean many people may be asking well we're going to go through uh a lesson today that's going to actually cover both of these uh segments of the title uh the first thing i want to start off with is a statement that uh bishop nathaniel has said and it and it, and i just wanted to throw it in there because i was trying to find um I was thinking about the, uh, the, the beauty in this statement here. And, the, and actually, he had uh, made the statement during the class of uh, uh, unworthy leaders. Don't be, be not a follower of unworthy leaders. I think that was a class that he said it in. And he made the point of saying that a leader takes more of his share of blame and less of his share of credit. Say that again. Leadership is very difficult. It's, a, it's, it's where you are the target. And that's when the bishop said that, it resonated with the rest of us, you know, because that target is on all our backs. It's not only on our backs, particularly at the tip top of the organization, if you will, but it, it pertains to the men up underneath the bishops and the deacons and the captains. So I thought that statement, among many other statements that Bishop uh, Nathaniel puts out is, um, Excellent, and, and, it's, and they're on point. So again, a leader takes more than his share of blame, meaning that they get more blame, more than their share of blame. Meaning if a woman falls out of a, out of a window, blame the bishop. <laughs> if somebody trips over a crack in the sidewalk, blame the bishop. You feel me? And I know I'm being sil silly with that, but when you, when, you are, when, when, when you are trying to do the work of the Most High and you're trying to bring the people of the Most High closer to the kingdom and there is an opposition, there is a force that wants to stop, them, stop this, wants to stop this truth, anything that they could manufacture, conjure up, they'll throw it at the leadership. Okay? But the good that the leaders do, they don't talk nothing about it. They don't talk about the, the, the thousands of brothers who have gotten their lives together, the thousands of the sisters that have gotten their lives together. They don't talk about how a lot of brothers and sisters that have come through these doors that had some severe problems. They would have been in jail uh, for, for a myriad of problems. Uh, 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 maybe it would have been abusive spouses, children all out of line, all kind of things. And once they come through these doors by the teachings of the bishop through the Bible, we were able to uh, rectify those problems, but you never get the credit for that. We clean up the communities. We don't get com we don't get uh, credit for that. We we do a lot of things, you know, and and, I, and I've outlined a few of the uh, of the things further down in the lesson. I'll just make a mere mention of it now. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of things like um, uh, to to encourage brothers to lose weight. Like the what we call the um, what was that fat burner program, uh, <laughs> you know. But the reason why that should be looked upon as you guys are doing a great work, that's the way it should be. Like I said, where's the credit at? And we know we're not gonna get into. So it's really I'm just saying this because we're not go, we're not gonna get into credit for this. Not from not from the world anyway. Uh, but when when we're telling our brothers and our sisters to eat healthy. That keeps them out of the hospital. That keeps that, that all kinds of other problems result in just simply bad health. There's, there's, there's such a drain that you could put on a city when, the people, when, when people have this excess problem of health 
Now you have to now you have to lean on others to come in to 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 help aid you. That's just on the sick level, on on the unhealthy level. So I'll just use that as an example. So when we instituted um, uh, the fat burner program, we also have a wellness program. Just think about how many times 911 would normally have to be called if we did not have a system where we check up on our old older people, on our you know people that that are up in age and different things like that. So there's many things that we do right, but we don't get any credit for it. So I thought that statement that Bishop said was on point. A leader makes, a, a leader takes more of his share of blame and less of his share of credit. But that's okay because we're going to get our credit when the Most High gives us the kingdom. Y'all all right? Yes, all praise to the Most High. Our lives are at serious risk as we fight the spiritual fight for righteousness. All of us, not just the bishops, not just the deacons, the captains, but any of us that seek to do the righteousness of, of the Lord in a wicked society, our lives are at risk. Okay? Let's read that. Uh, well, let's read Matthew 5. This is going to talk about our righteousness. Matthew 5, verse 6. Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 6. <laughs> Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. For they shall be filled. The Most High said, what well, is Christ? He said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's what our job is. This society don't want us to, uh, to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Uh, this, this, what you have in this setup, is that they want to blur the lines between righteousness and wickedness. So that you don't know which is which. So... You is most of our people now are hunger and thirsting for filth, for for sin, and for lasciviousness. So, the our eyes have been obscured to follow after wickedness and follow after evil. But read that again. Blessed are they. The scriptures say, but for those of us that that follow after God's righteousness, that's where the blessing is going to come in. Read it one more time. Blessed are they. Which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. The righteousness is the keeping of God's commandments. Let's read that. Give me Deuteronomy. What is it, 6.25? Let's read that. Let's find out what the righteousness is. Okay. Blessed are they which do hunger after thirst, uh, hunger and thirst after righteousness. I want that one and I also want Romans 10 and I think it's the second verse. Let's read those two. Okay, I haven't begun the class yet. The class is coming up right after the scripture here. <laughs> hey, I got to get through this. I got a, I got a lot here, so I want to make sure I get through this stuff. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 25. Mm -hmm. And it shall be our righteousness. And it shall be our righteousness. Go ahead. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. If we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God. So that's what the righteousness that we're supposed to hunger and thirst for. We're supposed to hunger and thirst for God's righteousness. Meaning keeping the commandments. Is that it? As he have commanded us. As God has commanded us. Okay, so our job is to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Now, give me Romans, Romans, the 10th chapter. Okay, like I made the point that our righteousness in this, in our, our trying to attain righteousness in this setup is difficult for many of our people, even the, mainly the ones in church. The people in the churches are the ones that are most deceived because they have purposely been given a program to deceive them. You're better off not even going to church. You're better off in the streets than going into the church. Because when you go into church, they, content, they, they purposely frame your mind around wickedness with a covering making you think it's about Jesus. Go ahead. Romans chapter 10 and verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. But the people have a zeal of God. That's what they go to church for. They have a zeal thinking that they're going to get the Lord when they go in there. They have a zeal for God, for the knowledge. Come on. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. For they being ignorant of what we just read in Deuteronomy. They don't know nothing about this. The people in the church have no idea what, what's required of them. The scriptures tell you that. 
uh, the Lord said, what is it that I require of thee, O Israel? And that's to keep the commandments of the Lord. In the New Testament, Christ said the same thing. If you love me, keep my commandments. Right. What's the world? What's going on with these churches where they just purposely just lie to the people? Because like I said, the objective of the church is to destroy you. Straight up. And I'm going to speak plain language. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. These churches are basically crack houses with a dope needle to your head to poison the way you think. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to give uh, all praise to the to the Most High and the Son Jesus Christ for the great classes that we've that we uh, had today. Uh, I saw Deacon Malachi's class, and I also saw Bishop Kanai's class. So I want to give the Most High a hand for the great classes that they put up. Give it up. <laughs> all praise to the Most High. So uh, continue. Where are we at? Yes, sir. Romans chapter ten and verse three. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. So if they're going about to establish their own righteousness, then the scriptures say, but, but they have not submitted themselves unto the, the righteousness of God. What is that telling you? Read it again. For they being ignorant of For God, they being ignorant, go ahead. Of God's righteousness. They don't know about God's righteousness. We just read what God's righteousness is. In the Old Testament, and we quoted it out of the New Testament where Christ said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Go ahead. And going about to establish their so own. So being that they're ignorant of God's commandments, they're going to make up their own commandments. That's what that's talking about. Going about to establish their own righteousness, which is not righteousness at all. It's wickedness. But the people making up their own righteousness and the churches are saying it's okay, knowing that it's totally different from what the Bible says. And the churches encourage them to go ahead on with your feelings. Your feelings are going to get you killed. Read that statement. Yes, sir. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. In other words, they never found the true truth. They never found the truth. They never found out what the scriptures mean. That's what it's talking about. Uh, go back to Matthews. Matthew 5 and uh, 6 again. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness. So you got to know what God's righteousness is. And that's the reason why we read it out of the Old Testament. And it's also in the New Testament as well. Get it for them in the New Testament in case there's some people that might not know exactly what I meant when I said that Christ said the same thing. In the Old Testament, it was Deuteronomy 6.25. And in, and, uh, and in the New Testament, there's one where Christ spoke about it. John chapter 14. That's the one. Uh, don't worry, the deep stuff is coming. I love, just want to keep it simple right now. John chapter 14, verse 15. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. See how simple that is? If you love me, keep my commandments. Go back to the Old Testament again. Keep my commandments. The Deut Old Testament, 625. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 25. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments. So the commandments, the commandments and the righteousness is synonymous. When you talk about God's commandments, you're talking about his righteousness. That's the reason why I wanted those two scriptures particularly, because they, they correlate perfectly with what we read out of Matthew. Y'all all right? And it correlates with what we read out of Romans. Okay? Them, for the people going about to establish their own righteousness... They have not submitted themselves. They have not submitted to the ways of the Lord. And the churches love to have it so. So the people are going to be destroyed if they don't get out of there. Okay. Uh, so now, give me the 10th verse. Matthew 5 and 10. Matthew chapter 5. Oh, it says, I'm sorry. The rest of 6 said, for they shall be filled. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. The Most High is going to bless the Israelites that keep his commandments. That's the point. We're going to be filled with the glory and the kingdom that the Lord's going to give us. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. 10 verse. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So in this wicked society, like I said, the churches ain't dealing with the righteousness at all because they're not persecuted at all. The persecution comes upon those who are really following God's commandments. Do you all understand that? It says, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. 
This is where that scripture comes in that says suffer, suffer as a Christian and not as a murderer and those other things that it speaks about in the New Testament. This is what this is talking about. If we're going to, we, we are persecuted, but we're persecuted because we're doing the will of God. We're persecuted because we're doing the, we're keeping the commandments of God. We're teaching our brothers and sisters, wives, husbands, and, and so forth to do right. Men and women, children. To do the right, to do the righteousness that God has recorded in the Bible, and because of that, that goes against the grain of wickedness. That goes against the flow of wickedness in the society. Okay, we are in the we are in the evil we are in the evil days, and for us to live righteously righteously in this, we are definitely going to run up against some persecution. But the Lord said, "Blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness' sake." Read that again. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Go ahead. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, those are the ones that's going to get the kingdom of heaven. See, that, see how beautiful that is? Yes, sir. We got a kingdom coming. The only thing we need to do is stay steadfast with this hymn. Hmm. Stay on course. Don't get deterred. Don't get discouraged. Don't get faint-hearted. No. Stay right here. Okay? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Y'all all right? Okay, now we're getting ready to get into the topic. I said, Dad, that didn't take long. I wasn't going to go a whole hour and all that. Then, no, no, no. We're going to get right into it now. Give me John 8, 32. Let's begin. St. John chapter 8, verse 32. Again, war in heaven and in earth. War in heaven and in earth. Let's read this. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Come on. And ye shall know the truth. And you Israelites shall know the truth. Go ahead. And the truth shall make you free. And the truth, the righteousness of God and the truth shall make you free. Shall make you free. That's a deep statement because that's exactly what it does. Like, like our elder used to talk about, uh, Elder Marshall back in the days. He said, man, when you know this Bible, he said, he said you know the future. That's what he would say. He said, you know, you know, the, the, like, like we read about uh, uh, Moses, and it says the midst, the, the ending, the beginning of time, the midst of, they showed that to Moses, showed him the whole thing. We are sit, we sitting in the same seat. We can go inside this Bible and pinpoint all time periods, knowing the future, knowing that the kingdom is coming to us. That's a beautiful thing. Read that again. And, and that's a level of freedom. To those of, uh, to those of, uh, to those of our people, who are, uh, who are downtrodden mentally or spiritually, who feel like they have no hope, and then they found out that they're the Israelites and, cried, and Christ died for them, that gives them hope. That gives them, that gives them vision. That gives them purpose. And to know that if they stay, like the scriptures say, he that endureth unto the end, to him uh, the kingdom will be given to him. I'm, I know I'm not quoting it right. They shall be saved, the scriptures say. Um, and to him will I give... Um, power over the nations. I'm mixing my scriptures up. So that's the beauty. And a, and a brother or a sister that hears that, when, the, when all their lives they were told that they were nothing, that they wouldn't amount to anything, and then they come to find out that they are in fact the Israelites that the Bible speaks of, and that the only thing they need to do is keep Christ's commandments and the kingdom is theirs. That's a beautiful thing to know. That's the freedom that we're going to get. Okay? And that will help you endure persecution for righteousness sake. Because we know that there's a, there's, a, there's a reward for what we're doing. Okay? Uh, read that again one more time. John chapter 8 and verse 32. Mm -hmm. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And the truth shall make you free. So we need to get some understanding about the truth. The truth in this system particularly, the truth is considered hatred to those who advocate and teach lies. To those who teach lies and advocate lies, the truth is considered a hate group. The truth is considered uh, uh, evil. The truth is considered repugnant. The truth is, 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 is considered disdained, unwanted, unfavored, unfashionable, out of style. I've even heard stuff like that. Oh, that's that old stuff. Let's come on in with the new times. No. This, the truth is hated. And it is considered hatred by those who advocate and teach lies. And the, and the objective of a liar is to gather and control all minds to conform to the lies. That's what's happening in the churches. That's the reason why the churches are so prevalent, especially in the black community. Black churches and white churches are totally different. When the white churches gather and there ain't no black people in there, they're talking about world dominance. That's what they're talking about in there. 
Any church that you find that's quote-unquote integrated, that's, it's only integrated for you to join them, for you to be put to sleep by them. But in reality, when they are behind closed doors to, to themselves, they're reading this Bible a whole to totally different way about how to stay in power. I think what Bishop Kanai went over uh, today was excellent because I understand their psychology, and I was glad he went over that. You know, being that, being that they, 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 nothing that they can do, for Esau cried heavily, and the scriptures say he was rejected. So being that that's the case, what else is he going to do? <laughs> Forget about it. He's going to try his best to make this thing last, make this wicked kingdom last as long as he can, while at the same time oppress you so that the kingdom will never come. That's, that's going to be in his nature. So we understand that. Uh, so, um, like I said, the objective of a liar is to gather and control all minds to conform to the lies. That's what the churches are, are created for perfectly. That's what they're created for. Like I said, I cannot understand how in the world could we be so blind if we got our right mind. How could you set up a church on top of blood and bones? The Native American people used to own this. And you kill them, move them out the way. Where are they at? Where are they at? Oh, we happily have them up on reservations, on their own land. You basically relegated them to the bathroom of their own house. And then you set up a church. You put a church on top of the blood and the bones. And then you tell the, you tell the slaves that you brought over here, come and learn about Jesus. That, that, has, that theology has not changed at all. Regardless of what label they put on it, Christian, church, and the first in Christ, and all that, all that's lies. The real doctrine is slavery, mental slavery. Come learn about being a slave. That's basically what all these crack houses, I mean churches, are all about. I keep mixing that. I keep getting that mixed up. No, you know, no, help me. Uh, but like I said, their objective is is uh, uh, their objective is to gather and control all minds to cause their minds to conform to lies. To the point where we say things like, what's the matter, boss? We sick? Whenever, whenever Esau is in trouble, whenever he's feeling, like I said, I used to see this, especially in New York. Esau would get out of a cab. He'd get out of a cab somewhere in midtown Manhattan or whatever. And he'll, look, he'll just look like he's lost. Don't let some black people be around. Black people will go, oh, are you lost? Did, can I? I mean, you can, see that they, you can see that they want to help. They want to aid him because we are trained. Listen good. We are trained to seek to their comfort. We don't even realize it. It's a deep psychological control in our heads. It's unconscious. You can't, you, you, by the time you realize it's happening, you're already doing it. When you see them distressed, you're already seeking their com comfort. He looks like he needs help. You don't know, you might be helping Ed Kemper. They don't know what I say when I say Ed Kemper. <laughs> Look him up. I ain't going to go no further than that. Huh? <laughs> you might be helping a mass murderer. This dude, Ed Kemper. I ain't going to talk about him. He'll mess my whole class up. <laughs> that sick dude. Uh, but you don't know what the hell you're doing. You just look at his white skin and, and your mind is already programmed. Your mind is already programmed. Seek to his comfort. And you have to catch yourself. Dig it. You got to catch yourself. That's the mind control that has happened to us. Well, we have to catch it and stop it. Wow, that's, that's, that's pretty dangerous, you know. So what's the matter, boss? We sick because if he's sick, if he's confused, if he's lost, we seek to their comfort, okay? And that's the perfect illustration of the slave mind. The purpose of the truth is to free your mind from this kind of thinking. And that's what this truth is set up to do to really make you free so that you can seek your own salvation. Don't seek the salvation of the man getting out of a cab, making sure that he get into the building safely. You dig it? Seek your righteousness. Don't worry about him. Now, of course, if we see somebody hurt and all that, you do the, you know, call the 911 or whatever. But don't let it be because we have a sick uh, love for them and, a, and at the same time ha have a hatred for your own brother. We won't do our own people like that. Black man get out the cab, nobody won't say nothing. Hell, the cab won't even stop for him. <laughs> Shoot, I, I remember that. Uh, get my video. I'm going to play my video because I was talking about uh, what's the matter, boss? We sick? And this is the mind, this is the mind uh, set that we have to free ourselves from. Watch this. Yes, sir. I want y'all to pay attention to this here. I'm starting it out now. So I'm talking about 
us freeing our minds from, uh, from mental slavery. Okay. You got it? Hit it. Back during slavery, when black people like me talked to the slaves, they didn't kill them. Stop. When we talk to our people, we try to give our people hope, give our people uh, encouragement, give our people the truth about Christ so that they can know that Christ was their brother, so that the sisters can know that Christ is their brother, so that the sisters can know about the famous people in the Bible, the f men and women, of, of, of good report. These are the things that will lift us up. But whenever somebody like us come to teach our people righteousness, what will happen? They'll send somebody right behind it, some way to undo what we said. That's what Malcolm is going to talk about. Play it. Come on. They send some old house Negro along behind him to undo what he said. To undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro. Stop. And the he said you have to repeat the history of slavery to understand this. Why am I going over this? Because there's, there's one scripture that I'm going to go through, and I'm going to stay on that scripture the whole class. And I'm going to mention the scripture in a minute. But he's making a point. He said that you have to repeat the history of slavery in order to understand this. Our people are taught not to do that. Our people are taught to, to, to shun our history, to not reflect on it, to stay away from it. Don't, don't bring that to me. Leave me alone. That kind of stuff. But in order for us to know what happened to us, you have to go back and look at the damage that was done to us. In order for you to make the proper decisions uh, uh, ahead of you, you have to know what happened to you in the past. Back it up just a little bit, and I'm going to let it play on. Come on. They didn't kill him. They sent some old house Negro along behind him to undo what he said. You have to read the history of slavery to understand this. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. Getting out the, the field Negroes got too Hold much it. out of the field Negro, the, the house Negro always looked out after his master. When, when the white master, because that's how they see him, gets out of the taxi cab and he looks confused, we always seek after their comfort. Malcolm is talking about this. Don't, don't move it. Look at the date that he said this. In 1963, I want y'all to remember that date. 1963, when he said this. Y'all all right? Sure. He was murdered two years later, if I'm not mistaken. 65, right? Yeah. Yeah, 65, because uh, Martin Luther King was killed in like 68. Uh, so, 1963, he made this statement. So, keep that date in mind. When we play the next video, you're going to understand why I said that. Uh, play on. Come on. There were two kinds of Negroes. There was that old house Negro and the field Negro. And the house Negro always looked out for his master. When the field Negroes got too much out of line, he held them back in check. He put them back on the plantation. The house Negro could afford to do that because he lived better than the field Negro. He ate better, he dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic. In other words, he got a job. That's, the, that's, that's this Negro today. He got a job. He's able to have a few benefits, and he's able to do a, a little bit of something. We bought a house and this and the other, and you can't tell him nothing. That's the house Negro. And he's looking at it like, Jesus got me these things. That's, that's how he's thinking. You, got, you really got to understand the, the, the psychology behind it. He's not looking at it like, I got this because of black people. I got this because of the Jesus white man. And whatever is needed to please him, I'm willing to do that. And that's psychologically stamped into his mind, whether he says it or not. Okay, go ahead. He dressed better, and he lived in a better house. He lived right up next to his master in the attic or the basement. He ate the same food his master ate and wore his same clothes. And he could talk just like his master. master. Good diction. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. He loved his master. Hold he, it. he loved his master more than he loved himself. Let me break that down. You already know that your people are messed up in the mind. But when you see this man jump, get out of a taxi, and he just looks lost, you won't even think about the fact that your people are strung out on drugs in mental hospitals and all kind of stuff. You will immediately seek to his comfort without even being told. That's some serious mental destruction. This is, this is, this is what we do. You might catch yourself, but the, uh, that initial 
startle response, I'll call it. That initial startle response sends you in that direction. And he already picked it up. Even if you change your mind, he said, okay, he's snapping out of it. He's supposed to come over here and seek to my comfort. I, I saw him coming, but somehow he must have listened to the Israelites and <laughs> kind of got his mind together, you know. But I'm okay. The white man said, but I'm okay, you know. Uh, so go ahead, play on. Let's, let's, be, let's get through this. And he loved his master more than his master loved himself. That's why he didn't want his master hurt. If the master got sick, he'd say, what's the matter, boss? We sick? When the master's house caught a fire, he'd try and put the fire out. He didn't want his master's house burned. Dang. He never wanted his master's property threatened. And he was more defensive of it than the master was. That was he the was, house negro. He was, hold it, pause it. He was more defensive of the white man's property, the white man's house, more than the white man himself. The white man himself said, well, hell, I got insurance. The Negro said, don't worry, we can take care of it, we can this and that, because that same white man is his Jesus that gave him his, his hog pen, like I talked about in another video. Gave him his hog pen. Okay? Go ahead. But then you had some field Negroes mm -mm, who lived it's in a different group. Had nothing to lose. They wore the worst kind of clothes, they ate the worst food, and they caught hell. They felt the sting of the lash. They hated their master. Oh, yes, they did. If the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. <laughs> if the master got sick, they prayed that the master died. You can't say that in church. You can't say that, listen, if my slave master gets sick, I'm praying for him to die. Would that be the wrong thing to say, class? Some people are confused about it. They said, that ain't the love of Jesus. Let me, let, let me line it up again. If your slave master got sick, would you pray for his behind to drop dead? They had to think about that. The word slave master went over their mind. He's Jesus. I don't see him as a slave master. He's a slave master. He's the one that's got our, he's the one that's got our people's minds twisted up. And we, we're teetering on the fence trying to figure it out. Y'all all right? No, you ain't. But y'all all right. Uh, <laughs> play on. Let's end this. Let's, let's get it on. 1963, Malcolm said this. If the master's house caught a fire, they prayed for a strong wind to come along. That's what the field negro said. Hey, listen, if the house, if the white man's house catch on fire, the slave master's house catch on fire, I'm praying for a wind to come along, to fan them flames. That's what that's about. Two totally different kinds of mentalities there. Go ahead. Between the two. Hey, 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 How they advocate in violence. They want to they wanna set fire to somebody's house. I'm not talking about nothing like that at all, and everybody knows that. But an enemy will try to invert and twist and change your words around. Why? Because they, they hate the message behind what I'm saying, which is to, which is to lift you out of, out of your mental death. They don't want that. They don't want that resurrection. They don't want that mind cl cleansed up. They want your mind to stay in a servitude posture. Go ahead. Negroes and field Negroes. He said there's a difference between the field Negroes and the, and the uh, he said, no, back it up again. I don't want to put what he said, just a little bit. Come on. For a strong wind to come along. This was the difference between the two. And today you still have house Negroes and field Negroes. You have them both. Okay, I think that's it on that, right? Let it play on out. Let's just make sure that's it, all right? I'm a field Negro. He said, I'm a field Negro. That's what we all are. Y'all follow me? All right, so keep that in mind. When I say I'm a field Negro, meaning that we are, we are what it says in the book of uh, Romans 12 and 2. Re re let's read that real quick. This is where we are. We don't advocate any violence. We don't advocate arson or anything like that at all. What we do advocate is for us to have our minds properly set up underneath the most high's uh, uh, commandments so that we can do the right things with our bodies. Notice that your mind, your head sits on top of your body. If it's on top of your body, it's supposed to govern your body, not govern somebody else's body. We'll end up looking out for somebody else's body. Meanwhile, our own body is dying. God puts your head on top of your body for you to have some sense to control your body and look out for your body. And do the things that are needful for the body. 
Where am I at? Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Mm -hmm. And be not conformed to this world. This is the field Negro. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. A field Negro has a new mind state. And, I'm, and, I, and I don't like to use the word field Negro, but you understand the analogy. Okay? It's basically saying that we don't have a slave master's mind. Okay? So uh, the Bible is saying for us to have our, our minds renewed in this truth. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the renewing of the mind that we're talking about here. I'm not necessarily talking about field Negroes or house Negroes. I'm talking about us having a mind of God so that we can follow our proper righteousness so that we can know what to properly hunger and thirst for. Y'all all right? Okay. So now that we've said that, give me my next video. Because Malcolm is making a point about house Negroes and field Negroes. Well, we're going to find out a little bit more about that. Now, before you press play, look at the date on the top of this. Show it. Now, the, fi the video that we saw was Malcolm X teaching, okay? And that was in 1963. Y'all all right? Yes, this interview, what you're looking at here, was recorded in 1983, 20 years later. Y'all all right? Yes, Notice what these brothers are going to say about the people in, in, in their times. Who, who, who was this man here on the screen? He was Malcolm X's bodyguard. Y'all hear me? He was Malcolm X's bodyguard. There's two of them. One was a photographer that quit his uh, news uh, company that he was working for. Because once he heard the teachings of Malcolm, he just said, well, hell, I'm just going to roll with that. And he just quit. And he went to work for Malcolm. Y'all follow me? And that's what, and you're going to hear that. You're going to hear, well, if you watch this whole video, it's a good video. It's like about an hour long. Take your time and go through it and watch it. It's very informative. A lot of good stuff in there. Uh, but these men were so impressed by the, by, the, by the dignity and the discipline of Malcolm. Uh, the photographer went to work for him. And this brother uh, went to protect him because they both heard the teachings of Malcolm. Now, let me make another statement about Malcolm, what y'all might not know which I might not know, Malcolm X used to speak with our elder in the old school, um, Yaquab, which is Ariel's father. Bishop Nathaniel knows the story. Uh, Bishop Kanan knows the story particularly. We know about the story. Um, so, so uh, and they used to, Malcolm X and Yaquab used to sit in front of what is what today is now known as the A Adam Clayton Powell Building in New York City, or in Harlem, 125th Street and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard, which used to be 7th Avenue. The building is located between 7th Avenue and Lenox Avenue, and Lenox Avenue is called Malcolm X Boulevard. So uh, that's what it's called now. It was Lenox when I was young. It was Lenox Avenue, and 7th Avenue was, I mean, and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard was 7th Avenue. 8th Avenue was Frederick Douglass Boulevard, so there you go. And the Apollo Theater was right, right up the street on 125th Street. Um, so, before that building was built there, that, that state office building was built in 1972. I, we, we lived on, on, on that avenue, and I actually watched the building get built. So, in 1972, that's when the building was completed. It's called the state office building, but it has Adam Clayton Powell's name on it. All praise to the Lord, right? Some, some dignity. Uh, but anyway, before the building was built, it was just an open area. Whenever y'all was to see... The speeches of, of Malcolm speaking in this open area, that's the area that he was speaking in before the building was built. It was just flat. It was just all dirt and all kind of stuff like that. So before that building was put there, that's where Malcolm and Yaquab used to actually sit. And Yaquab would go over the scriptures with him. So a lot of the stuff that Malcolm got to understand, like he understood that we was the, the Israelites in the book of Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. He said, you're the dry bones. You're the lost sheep. You're the people of whom the Bible is speaking of that's going to come to life, that's going to come alive in the last days. I got that speech too. And that speech is on the internet now. You can actually pull it up. Y'all follow me? But he had learned that from the Israelites. That's the point. Okay? And even in this interview, the photographer, his first assignment was to, was to learn about these different religions. And he mentioned what he had called the black Jews. That was the Israelites. That's what it's talking about. Everybody's understanding me. Everybody with me so far. So, 
these two men, Gil Noble, which uh, was from Like It Is, that's a television uh, magazine in New York uh, on Channel 7. Uh, this has come on Sunday. Um, he was searching because even Gil Noble knew Malcolm X. Okay? So he wanted to look for these men here. So he was searching for them. And he finally found them. And when he found this one, particularly that you're looking at, show the picture again. This one here was so emotionally traumatized because he would have been dead had Malcolm not told him to go make that phone call. And he, and he knew that Malcolm sent him to make the phone call because he did not want the brother to get killed. So every time he talks about Malcolm, he's always breaking into tears and crying and all that because he thinks about it and it just shows you how much this, how much this man loved him in terms of I'm going to spare your life by sending you out there and I'm going you know, to let it happen to me. And he realized that's what it was. And every time the cameras come on him, he's crying because he thinks about that. Y'all all right? So I mentioned that because as you can see, these people love their people. And, and I say all of that to further say that when he talks about how, we how we're supposed to be, he's going to make a comparison to how we are. And he's talking about the time period of 1983. 1983, he's, he's, he's going to talk about the condition of black people. Remember I was talking about the house Negroes and the field Negroes? He's going to basically repeat it. Okay, 20 years later, there ain't no damn change. That's the point. That's why I'm showing you. In 20 years, we have not really elevated in great leaps, in great leaps. You follow me? Got a few, you know, because after 63, you had the 64 uh, decision that said that we could sit on the same toilets and all that other stuff, right? And, you know, um, the civil rights decision, blah, blah, blah. But it didn't really help us. And he's going to make the point. Now it's in 1983, he's going to make the point, right? I know I'm a bit long-winded, but I wanted to make sure that y'all understood what y'all about to look at. Y'all okay? Yes, sir. Sisters, y'all all right? All right. Play it. Well, has echoed my sentiments. I think that uh, the reason why I decided to come here now is because uh, it's time. So he's, he's saying, answering, hold it. He's answering the question because Gil, I think Gil asked him. He said, I've been looking for you guys for a long time. And, and Earl, you have Earl Grant, what's his name? Earl Grant and Robert Higgins. That's, that's this man here, Robert Higgins. And they're both answering, why, why did you decide to talk to me now? Because I've been chasing you guys for years. And he says, it's time. So that's what he's answering. Everybody's with me? Sisters, y'all all right? Okay, go ahead. Because uh, it's time. You see... Young black people out there are looking for leadership. They're looking for motivation, some kind of inspiration. And it's up to us to provide that for them, to let them know that uh, <clears throat> the only solution to the black problem is not to force yourself on somebody else, to stop begging and knocking at the door and chasing white people all over the globe. It's time to stop and reassess your own values as a human being and to, <clears throat> to set proper goals, to learn organization, to learn research techniques, to, to look at organizations, to organize to solve your own problems. Is there some way in which in understanding his life and death, it'll be of help to now us pause today. Pause it. Pause it before we let him answer that question. Did y'all hear what the other brother said? It's time for us to to come out of the Negro house, the house Negro, and do, stand up and do something for ourselves. And that when you when when you come to that point, that's when you're going to take on this truth and you're going to become a man with it. That's when you're going to become a woman with it. You're going to stand on your own too and accept Christ as our Savior, and He's going to save us from the hand of our enemies. Okay, because they don't know this truth like we do. But I'm just using this to illustrate the times. And I, and I particularly find it important to bridge times with us. And I'm just saying that from a personal uh, perspective. And what I mean by that is that there's so many gaps. There's gaps in our generations, or what they call generational gaps, where people today will have no clue on how brothers just 20 years ago was thinking. You understand? 
because the media have, have successfully divided up the sons from the fathers, have divided the daughters from their mothers, and they have no connection to what happened just 20 years ago, 30 years ago. For, don't even know recent history. I'm, even here, I'm hearing stuff like brothers are in school, and they ask them about slavery, and they'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, they don't even know that we came over here on slave ships. I mean, it's horrible now. So I try to make it my business whenever I can to bridge his, bridge history because it's supposed to be continuous. You're supposed to, you're supposed to uh, learn from your history. You're supposed to uh, develop and evolve from your history. These things are important. We always, it seems like every generation we got to start all over again because we have, we, where's our footprints? You know, could you imagine that you have no footprints? This is sickening. Where's your footprints? What was the way you travel? If you don't know which way you came, you end up turning around and walking in the same place because the footprints are gone. And you just left there. That's how important it is for you to know where you came from. You want to know what path you walked. You want to look back and say, okay, well, I came from that direction, so I know I need to keep going this way. But if you have no footprints, you don't even know which way you're going. That's what has happened to us with our minds being messed up. We don't even know which way is up. 20 years after Malcolm made that statement, listen to what this brother's going to say here. Play it. Uh, what they have to understand, well, Americans, are, uh, people in this country in general, are, are known for not knowing very much about the past. They have to understand, especially this young generation, that a lot of these people with their MBAs and their sports cars and their their uh, corporate vice presidencies, they have to know that they're not there just because of the way they wear their clothes or the way they part their hair. That somebody paved the way for them to get there and that they owe some debts and that they have a responsibility to history to do something else other than just check cashers every week. They have pause a role it, pause to... It. We have to be more than just check cashers. Cause that's basically what we've become as a people. We just check, we go to work, get our check, and go buy a car, go buy this and go buy that, do it again next week, buy this, buy this, buy that. And you know what? I, I'm glad I just, because I, I, it was something that I wanted to say earlier. Y'all hear people say, where's our reparations? We want our reparations, we want our reparations. If your mind has a, has a limit in thinking, like the hog pen mentality, can I, I'm sorry, I'm a segue for just a second. Could we go and pull up the thing in the Willie Lynch thing about the hog pen? I got to break it down. I got to break it down. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Give me the, the page. I, pl I played it a couple of weeks ago for the Bible Book of Our Fathers. Look for that. Go on the Bible, the Book of Our Fathers, and pull up the Willie Lynch book, uh, the Willie Lynch, and bring the page up about the hog pen. I know it when I see it. Just pull it up. Let me see. Just bear with me, brothers and sisters. And remind me, because I'm talking about, um, um, what's the thing? Uh, reparations. Start from the top. Read that. For example, if you told a slave that he must perform in getting out our crops, and he knows the language well, he would know that our crops didn't mean our crops. Right. And you read that right, too. Go ahead. And the slavery system... So if you got a black man, what they call a slave, and a white man try to say, listen, what's the matter, boss? We sick? Like, because that's why they really want us. He said, the house that I live in is your house too. But in reality, it ain't. You follow me? But if you are thinking that it is your house as well, or if you think that when the master says, my crops are our crops, you think that the crops are yours too. But if he knows that my world is separate from your world. And if you're telling me about your crops, then your, our crops ain't really our crops. Those are your crops. This is your country. You follow me? Like, like you hear some of us say, like, our country. What the hell you mean, our country? That's the same understanding. Y'all all right? Y'all follow me? That's what this is saying here. But if you understand that this is not really your country, you're just in it. If you're just in it and you understand that this is not your country, that means you got a mind that is outside of the circumference of thinking that this is yours only, meaning your mind is limited. You'll follow what I'm saying? Yes, 
Okay, that's why they call it ex what they call it thinking out the box. Well, they have another word for it, a uh, 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 trigger word. They say you're a radical or you're an extremist. To, to be extreme means to go beyond a given point. White man says your given point is for you to think like this and nothing else. So if you go beyond that, he said you're an extremist. If you go beyond that, you're radical, meaning radius. You, you're, going beyond the, 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 you're going beyond the distance that he said for you to be in. You follow me? So if you're going to tell me about our crops, no, man, those are your crops. My crops exist in my own country. He said, if you get that kind of thinking, the slavery system wouldn't even work. That's what this man is saying here. Y'all all right? Read that yellow. Yes, sir. For example, if you told a slave that he must perform in getting out our crops mm -hmm. and he knows the language well, he would know that our crops didn't mean our crops. <laughs> Wow. Go and, ahead. And the slavery system would break down. And the slavery system would break down because the slavery system that we're under now is mental. Okay. We perpetuate slavery. Go ahead. For he would relate on the basis of what our crops really meant. He would understand what our crops really mean, meaning these are your crops. These are not mine. I need to go get my own crops. How in the world you can have a slavery system and he's talking about doing something for himself? Go ahead. You want the bottom part? Uh, yeah, go to the bottom. Lift it up. Now read this here. For example. For an example, I just jumped down and highlighted this so you can, we go piece it together. Everybody's with me? Yes, sir. Read. For example, if you put a slave in a hog pen. Now, this is, I'm, I'm bringing this up to talk about reparations. If you put a, a slave, so they'll call us slaves. Go ahead. If you, for instance, for an example, if you put a slave in a hog pen, go ahead. And train him to live there mm -hmm. and incorporate him. To train him like his life exists in there. I think they got a typo there, perhaps. Uh, for an example, if you put a hog in a hog pen and train him to live there as if that's where his life exists. Go ahead. And incorporate in him to value it. And you make him value that hog pen. He knows nothing else. He only knows about the hog pen. Go ahead. As a way of life completely. As a way of life completely, meaning his whole being is about being inside that hog pen. Tell me what reparations would do if he was to get it, and this is the, this is the extent of his thinking. He won't do anything but buy rims, buy BMW, buy Mercedes-Benz sneakers, jackets. Montclair jackets, I think I learned the right word now, right? I, I kept saying eight ball jackets that kept looking at me. So I said, what is, what is it called, the Montclair jackets now? They'll buy Montclair jackets, you know, stuff like that. That's, that's, that's where we'll be because our, 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 our thinking is, is shaped within that hog pen, if you will. Okay, read. The biggest problem you would have out of him is that he would worry about provisions to keep the hog pen clean or particularly, uh, excuse me, or partially clean or... He might not worry you at all. He might not worry you at all. He might just be content with the hog pen. He might just leave it the way it is. But the point is, he will not think outside of that. He, his mind will not go any further, no matter what you give him. Case in point, we are so destroyed as a people. How in the world is it that we give, how much money did we give to the U.S. economy every year? $1.4 trillion. And we cannot make that money work for us because our minds is encapsulated in a hog pen. That's the problem. So no matter how much money they would give, because this is what we work for. If they was to give you reparations, we would do the exact same thing because you will not do anything beyond your vision. And if your, vision's, if your vision is the circumference of a hog pen, that's where everything you do completely, like the, like the word said. Your life completely, you would do everything to fit within that frame. And that's, go back to the other video. I ain't got, I ain't got to read no more of this. Go back to the, to the video now. So now you understand what the brother was saying. They're just check cashers now. We just, we just get paid and we do we spend it on the club. What, what, what is what we do? We spend it on the club. We spend it, what is this? Okay. Um, so I guess post it up there. But while yeah. uh, while you're putting that up there, um, what was what was the statement that I was making? We spend it on rims. We spend it on right. The, the, the reparations you would not go nowhere. You will you would only do exactly what your mind is capable of thinking. You won't think nothing beyond that. Okay, trillions of dollars will mean nothing. 
check cashes. We go now. I know what's going. Mm -hmm. Check cashes. When we go to we go to work, we get our check. What do we do as a people? Friday night, just got paid, spending on some girls, some hotel, get a little nuki. You understand? Whatever, spending on some moed. You know, stuff like that. Sunday, go to church. Monday, we're back in church again. I mean, back to work again. And that's our whole life. No matter how much money we'll get, we won't do nothing to disturb that cycle. We won't do anything to break that cycle. Just think about that vicious cycle of nothingness. That's where we will be. That's what Willie Lynch, here goes some people, that Willie Lynch thing ain't real. You stupid as hell. You fit exactly what we're reading. That's the reason why you can't see it. Because you're in a hog pen, your damn self. <laughs> the hell is this? Uh, okay, did we? What, 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 what we got? You got it? We're going to come back to the video. Let me see what Captain Amazai sent. I don't even know what I'm looking at. This Bring is, it out. Here Captain. it is right here, Bishop. This oh, Lord of mercy. <laughs> <laughs> this <pi> <laughs> so, here it is. Here is he is the house nigga. I mean, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Him. The so, house, hey, we got to say it. The house nooker. Okay, nooker. <laughs> Here's the point. I, where do y'all see this pitch at before? Who done this? Did anybody know who done this first? Who, anybody know who done this? He, this is the same thing Donald Trump done. He hugged the flag. This is my country. That's what he's saying. Wow, that's deep. And he's showing us, and he said that uh, they talked to him uh, earlier today. Our and, crops. Uh, our country. crops. This yeah. is our country. Now, Amazon that's, that's, that's said this point. is a mayor that was elect. They spoke to him today in Macon, Georgia. Our country. And look at him. Damn. This is our. To show you how different perspectives can be when looking at the same thing. I, I heard somebody mention this before. They say, you know when you, you, know when you have a serious uh, uh, division in thinking. When, you can, when two people can look at the exact same thing and come up with something totally different. Put it back on the flag, uh, Nooka. <laughs> Put it back on the flag, Nooka. I'm, I'm, don't worry, I ain't going to leave my brother out. I'm coming back to my brother. Not this. The thing that, that Captain sent you. Yes, sir. Zoom in. Tracy for State House, so he's running for office and all that. And he's grabbing the flag. He probably don't even hug his wife like that. Uh, well, I ain't going to. He, he, he probably get mad and say, man, why are you talking like that? You know, so I, I ain't going to say that. I'm sure the man loves his wife. So don't, don't send me no letters. But anyway, I'm dealing with the mentality rather than the person himself. You'll follow me. Because this brother can repent. Hopefully he does one day. Um, but like I've said, two people looking at the same thing and coming up with two totally different viewpoints has a lot to do with your education. He's looking at the flag and he's hugging it like this is the land of the free, home of the slave, I mean home of the uh, brave, you know, and all that. You know, and this is, you know, this, this is the reason why I have what I have. And I'm going to hug this flag. I'm going to kiss it. I'm going to dance with it. That's how he's looking at it, right? The red, white, and blue means something totally to him. But for the, for the field Negroes, can you dig it? Bring it out. The field Negroes will view that same flag totally different. Let me give you an example. The field Negro will say, the red is for all of the blood we shed. The field Negro will say the blue is for the blues that we've been singing for over 400 years. The slave, the, the field Negro will say the stars is for what we saw when we got our heads beat in. Right. And the white is for the obvious. He said, ain't no black in that flag. So two people looking at the exact same thing can be totally different in terms of their spirit. Dependent upon their education. Our man was educated to embrace and love this flag. And that's the reason why he's thinking the way he's thinking. The other brother had a different upbringing. He learned that our crops don't really mean our crops. Right. Those are your crops. That's your flag. I'm here, in, I'm here in captivity. I'll abide by the laws and all of that. But I understand that I, there's a country that I'm seeking for. When my Lord and Savior come back to save me, he's going to give me what actually belongs to me. Yeah. And that's what I'm working for. Y'all understand? But a house Negro don't think that way. He said, what? Leave for what? Are you crazy? You know, so that's the point there. Let's go back to my brothers. Let's go back to the brothers. Thank you, uh, Captain Amaziah. You're all right. <laughs> Hit me. <laughs> you 
something else other than just check cashers every week. They have a role to play. They have a people to serve. And, and until they, and unless they do that, as George Santayana said, people who don't understand the lessons of history are doomed to repeat them. And uh, there were a group of people in Europe a few years ago who thought they were just other Germans. They thought they were super Germans. Unfortunately for them, that wasn't so. And you've got a lot of people, a lot of our younger people coming out of these schools and going into these corporations. They think they're just another corporate figure. Well, that's not so. No way. That's not so. They're only there because somebody paved the way and, and like those kids down in the south, that church that was blown up. They were like preachers down there were trying to get people to register to vote that were killed. Dr. King being killed. Med Gavers. All this younger generation need to have it burned into their brain how they got where they are. And that the road was not, it was not easy and that they are not in heaven. That's one of their main problems. They think they're in heaven now, but they're not. They're still here. They got a long way to go. Job, if you... That's what the job, the, 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 the weekend, Friday night just got paid, the Moet, the Sunday jumping up and down and going right back to work, and I got my rims, and I got my BMW, I got my this and that and the other. That made a Negro think he's in heaven. You feel me? But the brother is making the point that the we have to understand that people paid the way. That's the reason why I, I, I repeat it often. You will never hear me disrespect on my elders, the people that taught me particularly. You won't hear me speak about brothers from the 60s, the Panthers, any of them. You're not going to get me to do that. You understand? And then when I'm hearing them talk about Medgar Evers, sometimes you got to go back. Like, like Malcolm said, you got to go back to repeat the history of slavery to understand where we are today. I'm saying the same thing about just dealing with Mega Evers, for an example. Do you know what it's like? Him, He's trying to, and I mean, yes, we can question their motives and all of that, but these people believed in what they were doing. You follow me? And it had some benefit, it, you know, it, and the Lord was behind all of that. We were able to come out on the street and all that and teach. We cannot take these quote-unquote freedoms for granted. Because people died for this. And what I mean specifically, I'm going to speak about uh, uh, Medgar Evers and some of the traumas that he faced. And sometimes we don't think about this. Don't you know that when he was in his house, you had the white man shooting through his windows. And his family had to seek shelter in their bathtub. Because the bullets were, of course, the tubs, you know, that's like the safest place to be. Imagine that. You hear gunshots and you have to corral your family up. Come on, let's get in the bathtub. You put them in the bathtub and you don't know when the bullets are going to stop. You don't know what day they're going to come in. The first bullet is the warning. You don't even know. Just imagine being traumatized. You having that happen a, a series of days, even on the days that they don't shoot, you're already prepared. So that keeps you on edge. Trauma. Uh, exaggerated startle response. That's another term. These are the things that happens to us in these kinds of, uh, in these kinds of conditions. And for, for those things to, to go by and for people today to act like we just got here and we don't have to pay any respects, we don't have to take a note to history, we don't have to have, to have some kind of reverence for the, for the brothers and sisters that fought. You understand? We're going to keep these commandments, but the Lord uses all of these people. Meaning our, our forefathers, even the ones that didn't know the truth. These are the things that we have to remember, and that's what this brother's talking about. We've forgotten about all of that, and now we just check cashes, and we think we're in heaven. And that was in 83. Just look at how the people, they're even worse now. Forget about it. Now they don't, over know, now they don't even know what sex they are. That's how far, that's how far down we've gone. I'm about to get into the crux of my lesson right after this. But I'm just paving the way, just getting your minds saturated to be able to receive where I'm going. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Sisters, y'all okay? Okay. All right. Y'all a little bit quiet over there. I guess if that, that might be a good thing, meaning y'all absorbing and y'all getting this. Is that what that means? Okay. Good. Uh, play on. There's this book entitled The Choice. There's an article in there where he talks about a study in 1970 by the U.S. Navy 
what would be the attitude of white people in this country if black folks were beginning to be systematically suppressed like the, the uh, Jews in Germany. And the study pointed out that most white people wouldn't care. I mean, that's a horrifying thought for me. I mean, really, really disturbing that anybody would even think to, to conduct a study like that in this country is scary. But that was the, the conclusion of it. If they started rounding up black folks and started making them disappear from the city, most people wouldn't care. They just wouldn't care. That's what the study said. I've been trying to find that study. I've been trying to find that article. I've talked to a few people in the, in the Navy. Cause it, was a, it was a Naval um, article where they wrote the study in it. So I've been trying to find it. I'm still looking for it. I'm still looking for it. But did you hear what he said? He said that there was a study that was conducted that if they started rounding up, systematically rounding up all black people and just systematically exterminating them, they said they asked, the, they asked Esau, how would you feel about it? And they all basically said, we don't care to hell with him. And people are upset with that statement. But the thing that he said after that was even worse than the statement itself. Because what it shows is that our condition must be so bad that it even wrought the, the, uh, the, the idea to even conduct a study like that. Eliakim was, to, Officer Eliakim was telling me something two weeks ago on the show about, can you mention that thing about the, about the study of the uh, black people when they come to, to each other? Yes, sir. Uh, psychologists and uh, body language experts, they had... The body done, language experts. So that means they're watching us like we're lab rats or something. They had done uh, research and done some tests and done some observations on how black men particularly walk past each other on the street and the way that they close up or look down or look away and so forth. They don't do it as if this is my brother. They do it as, you know. For someone to take note and to pay attention to the nuances of how we act when we get near each other, that means there's something seriously troubled. There's something about us that rots the attention. For this. You know what? Let's do a study on that. Let's do a study on this. That's like what we just saw in the film. The same thing. He said, well, he said the, the situation with us must be so bad. Let's ask how would people feel if they were just gotten rid of. Somebody had to actually think about that by looking at the non-productiveness of us. That's basically what it is. That we become check cashers. And if we're just check cashers, do we really need these people? Well, we're going to miss football and basketball and entertainment. Please me, nigga. We'll miss that. Because we ain't found no white boys that can, that can dribble that ball like that, that can play that violin, or that can sing. Lord, can they sing? So we don't want to really lose that. <laughs> you understand? But go ahead, like you were saying. Yes, sir. So they had noticed basically how we look away, we look down, we look with fear, we look with uh, a need to assert a dominance in some cases. That's what they were basically going into. And how there's a fear or a feeling of uh, not being safe or a feeling of this person isn't my brother, but in fact a threat to me because he's not just like me. He's not what I am. He's something completely different. For our, for our behavior to be so pronounced that people say there's enough pronunciation to our ill behavior to the point where we can do a study on it, that says a lot. Y'all feel what I'm saying? So what, what, what am I really saying? Because a lot of people will hear this and get terribly discouraged. They're like, well, damn, I didn't want to hear no class like this. My, my point is, is that you have to pay attention to the rottenness that's in us. You have to look. In, in order for us to solve a problem, which is leading me to what the class is actually about, in order for us to get to a point where we're trying to fix a problem, you have to know what the cause of the problem is. You have to get into the deep bowels of the issues that's causing the sick behavior. And oftentimes, we're taught to ignore that. That's the reason why I was making a point about the, historic, the uh, generational gaps. You won't even know anything about the footprints that you just walked through. You have to know that. You have to talk to your fathers. Give me that in the Bible. I know I need a Bible scripture. Give me a Job. Yeah, give me that. This is why we need this thing. And we get ready to hit more biblical scriptures. It's coming up now. I've been talking enough, but it's time to get it in. I had to, had to bring these points out, though. Okay? I always have to ask, are y'all all right? 
All right. You got me? Yes, sir. Read it. Job chapter 8 and verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age. For inquire. Inquire means to, to, to seek and ask. Summons your father. Summons your elders. Talk to those older people that know something, that can tell you which way to walk because they already walked it. This is, this is the benefit. And I was talking to someone, was it this morning? I was talking to you, Captain. And I was making a point that when I, when I was growing up, I was, taught to, to, I was taught to always value older people. I never really ran with people my own age when I was younger. I always liked to listen to them older men because I understood something early in life is that they ain't all fools. You know how people talk about that old fool, he don't know nothing. The, the point is, you can't get to be old being a fool. A lot of young 20-year-old nookers think they know something dead as hell, pushing up daisies. They can't tell me nothing. An older person can tell me how to get past the, past the years of 20 to 30, because they're in their 50s, they're in their 60s. I can learn something from somebody that's older. You feel me? That's what the scriptures are saying. You get a young guy talking about something, I'm an elder. Nigga, you 20, nooker, you're 25 years old. What the hell do you know? No, talk to them older brothers. Okay? Read that again. Job chapter 8 and verse 8. For inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and prepare thyself to the search of their fathers. Learn, your fathers will tell you the footprints. Prepare yourself to the search of your fathers. Son, when you were born, you started these footprints here. And you walk from this point to where you are now. But you want to talk to me, son, don't you? Yes, Dad, I want to talk to you. Well, what do you want to talk about? Well, I want to know the footprints that you laid. Okay, but you got to talk to me in order to learn that. The way we are today, we don't do that. We have no connection to our past. That's what the brother was saying. And this history needs to be burned in our people's heads. Because if you don't know where you came from, you'll end up turning right back around and walking into the same place that you thought you didn't even know you was already there. And this is what's happening. This is the hog pen mentality. We're going around and around in a circle in the hog pen. You never can think outside of it because you don't even realize that you're constantly walking in a circle. You don't even know nothing about progressing. You don't even know nothing about going forward. It's a heavy deal. Y'all all right? So I say all of that. So thank you for reading that scripture. Now, uh, like I said, that was, you know, you looked at a 20-year difference from when Malcolm made the point about our mental state. 20 years later, 1983, you basically got the same kind of mentality. And even from that point up to now, things have damn near gotten worse. You follow me? Like I said, a lot of us don't even, you know, you look at a man, he was born a man, and he's talking about some he's a woman. And we'll argue. Damn, they get you locked up. That's how crazy things are now. You feel me? And it'd be black folks with a white mind. Can you dig it? Give me the book of Micah, chapter 4, verse 10. What we need to understand is that this whole system has been designed to keep us as slaves. And this is the war that is happening in the earth right now. Hence the title. War in heaven, I'll deal with the heaven a little bit later, and earth. War in heaven and in earth. Now, I'm dealing with the war in earth now. Y'all all right? So, read. Now, this, this scripture, Micah 4, I'm going to be dealing with this scripture all throughout the rest of the class. you will be like, well, how the hell are you going to do that? You want to know how I'm going to do that? Because I'm going to go through it piece by piece and show you a whole setup within how we're supposed to move with this one, two verses, 10 and 11. Y'all all right? Let's read. Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. So we know that scripture, right? Be in pain and labor. We're going to read the whole thing first, then we're going to go through it and break it down. Read it again. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion. Go ahead. Like a woman in travail. Come on. For now shall thy go forth. For now shall thou go forth. Go ahead. For shall thou go forth out of the city. Go ahead. And thou the city is talking about Babylon the Great. It's going to prove out. Go ahead. And thou 
shall dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. This is Babylon the Great, because that's what it's talking about. Read on. There shalt thou be delivered. There from Babylon the Great shall we be delivered. In our deliverance, we're going to deal with war in heaven. So it says, there shall thou be delivered. Read. There. The Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thy enemies. There, in Babylon the Great, the Lord is going to deliver us from the hand of our enemies. Babylon, the actual country, the actual uh, area, or the kingdom, I should say, we were not delivered from the hands of our enemies during the time of Babylon. We went from Babylon to Persia and Mede captivity. So we were not delivered from the hands of our enemies. So the Babylon that is talking about here. It's talking about Babylon the Great. I'm going to prove it with the other scriptures coming up. Y'all all right? Read on. Read 11. Verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. From, so what does it say now? Read it again. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. Against thee. I want to put stress on that. He said, it, the, the scriptures say, now also many nations are gathered, gathered against thee. Come on. That say, let her be defiled. And let our eye look upon Zion. Let the nation of Israel be defiled with a, with a messed up mind. With a mind where we can't even think outside of a hog pen. So that's the, the many nations are in cahoots, are in agreement, are in confederation to make sure that we never wake up. Some of this controversy, a lot of brothers and sisters have been hearing about Kanye made a statement about the Jews are made uh, that the Israelites are black and that the white man is not a Jew. He told the truth on that. I know he got other issues, but I ain't going to, you know, I know the brother's going to be dealing with that in and out. But that's the truth. But, you know, whether it's for a gimmick, whether it's for selling records, that's, that's another, that's somebody else could deal with that. But in terms of the statement, when he said it, immediately the enemies went to attack him. Y'all feel me? Because the objective is for us the objective is to fulfill what's in Psalms 83. Give me that. If he was talking about some day the Jews. Let's see. So-called white people talking about they're the Jews. Not according to the Bible. Maybe according to your book that you have written somewhere, but not according to the Bible. Mm -mm. Psalms. Psalms 83 verse uh, 3. Psalms chapter 83 and verse 3. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. All of the nations that are gathered together against us have taken crafty counsel against the people of the Lord, against thy people. Go ahead. And consulted. And they have consulted. They had consultations. A consult it. A cons a, read that to um, the concert thing again. You almost made me miss and it. And consulted. Consulted. Cons to, to when you consult, that means you're calling in experts, what they call consultants. I need a consultant to tell me how to do this. I need a consultant on to tell me how to. Those are experts. What are these experts? Witches, preachers, sorcerers. That's what they actually call it. How do we keep the children of Israel in mental bondage? Read that statement again. And consulted. Against thy hidden ones. And they have consulted, consultations with experts in demonology. Consulted against, against, against thy hidden ones. The so-called white man that's running around calling himself a Jew ain't hidden at all. You feel me? The Bible says that the real Israelites will be a hidden people. How is it that we're hidden? Could they put different names on us? They basically covered up the brand name that God gave us. The name that God gave us is Israel. They said, no, we're going to cover you with Afro-American. We're going to cover you with Dominican. We're going to cover you with Puerto Rican. We're going to co cover you with West Indian. We're going to cover you with Haitian. That's what the people are going to know you for. So what is that saying? That in reality, the real us is hidden. Read that again. They have taken crafty counsel. And it took crafty counsel to do this. Crafty counsel means that it's in their schools. It's in their business practices. Chase Manhattan, just like what they just did with the, with, with the brother. They have taken crafty counsel. Anybody that says anything about us being the Jews, if they have enough prominence, they know they have to move swiftly to quiet that, to quell that, to shut that down. That's, the, that's some evil right there. From a, from, a, uh, from a wicked consultant, a witch, 
a preacher that goes through the Bible to try to find scriptures, to try to find a religion to keep our minds in church destroyed. Read. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. You know, this crafty counsel goes deep. It's something I wanted to bring out also. Uh, and I'm thinking, I'm wondering if I sent it to you, I'm, but I'm going to check in a minute. Uh, they have taken crafty counsel against thy people. I'm going to stop there for a minute, then, then we'll read the next part. Crafty counsel. Crafty counsel means we have been given an education that is totally inferior. Y'all all right? Uh, education that does not serve to actually make us free. It only teaches us how to be check cashers. I'm going to just say it straight up. What you learn in school and in college only teaches us as black and Hispanic people how to continue to be on the hamster wheel of a check casher. And even if you got reparations, you would do nothing but spin it right there in the hamster wheel because that's the extent of our thinking. How are we looking, Egil? Okay, all praises. Uh, so, let me see. Go to my pic. Yeah, here, yeah, you got it. In the first folder, that first folder, right there. Show that to the. Now, what, now before you show it, I want to read something out of this book. This, this illustrates how the crafty council worked. Y'all might have heard me talk about other books that dealt with education. You heard me mention things like The Miseducation of the Negro by Carter G. Woodson. Y'all hear me uh, speak about this. Now, get, let's get this understanding because uh, me and Bishop talked about this. And it is a true fact that none of these men, sometimes when I feature these books, none of these men believed in the most high. You follow me? So they got to get their heads examined in terms of that. But the but Medgar Evers didn't believe in the Most High. Martin Luther King, none of them did. You follow me? In terms of what we're learning about us being Israel. You follow me? But there's still, there's still things that they've done, said, wrote that is beneficial to us today. Y'all feel me? Everybody's with me? So that's the reason why I'm highlighting uh, this particular book here. Um, so when I'm talking about the educational system, one of the other books that I was thinking about was, was a book entitled Countering the Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys. And he makes, uh, Dr. Jawanza Kanjufu, he makes the point in saying that the, uh, that the educational system has programmed within their curriculum that by the time your black son gets to the fourth grade, he enters what is loosely known as the fourth grade failure syndrome where he begins to withdraw from academics and he, and he begins to draw himself close to a football. Apathy sets in. And all kinds of other things set in. It's automatic. This is automatically, the system is automatically geared to, to kill the aspirations of your children when they start out in school. There's records, documents that points that says that when our children enter into the school system, there was a there was one particular uh, study that spoke about this brother. That when he entered into the school system as in kindergarten in the first grade, he was in the 98th percentile of, of intelligence. And it was, uh, you know, when they measure intelligence according to how they measure it, basically a walking genius. By the time that same person ended up in the fourth grade, he, he didn't like school. He was more connected to his football and dump truck and his, 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 uh, his aspirations for for ingenuity, for engineering thinking, uh, technical uh, uh, thinking, those things had already vanished. So it's purposed to kill the aspirations of your sons. You hear what I'm saying? This is a fact. This is a fact. Now, let's go inside the book. This book, let's show the book. Black, Black men, obsolete, single, dangerous, the African-American family in transition. The African American Family in Transition. It was written by this brother by the name of Haku R. Madhabuti. Okay, uh, I have before I even go into any more about him. That doesn't matter. I actually, he was on the uh, program on the Donahue program in New York years ago, sitting on the stage with Shaharazad Ali. That's what I saw the two of them sitting there. So you can actually, you know, you're into that thing. 
Go inside the book. This is what I really want to get to. Like him, I want you to read this whole, see what I got it marked in the blue? Yes, sir. I want you to read this. And the reason why I want to bring this out, because it's going to tie in what I was talking about when I, when I spoke about how our children are killed. There's, a, there's basically an educational killing field for the minds of our young men. And this is why, we're, why we end up being nothing but check catchers. All of this stuff ties together. So when we read the scripture where it says, be in pain, this is what I'm talking about. We're bringing out pain now. In order for us to get to the root of our problems, we got to deal, deal with the root of it. We got to deal with the cause of it. And if you don't talk to your fathers, if you don't talk to your elders, you will, every generation we got to start from scratch. We got to start from scratch because we don't value our fathers, that old fool. No, you stupid as hell. You better listen to your father. The fact that he made it to be 60, 50, 60, and 70. The fact that he even made it there. You know what it takes to stay alive in this wicked system? You better value that. They're trying to kill our people off the minute they even attempt to do anything like have a family. To be a righteous uh, member of the community or anything. For him to make it through all of those traps. And then he had the, he had the blessing to have you. And then you're going to look at him and say, ah, oh, he don't know what's happening. You're a fool. You're the fool. Read. One year? One year on my birthday. So, my again, why am I bringing this out? Because I'm going to show you how the educational system killed our aspirations. I want you to listen to the differences in how black people grow up and how white people grow up. From a kid. Read. One year on my birthday, my mother took me to a five and dime store to buy me a gift. Mm -hmm. She bought me a blue plastic airplane with blue wheels. Now, he's actually talking about himself. Mah uh, what's the name? Mahabuti. Ma Ma Mahabuti. Haki Mahabuti. He's actually talking about him. He said, one year on my birthday, my mother took me to a five and dime store to buy me a gift. Go ahead. She bought me a blue plastic airplane with blue wheels, a blue mm -hmm. propeller, and mm -hmm. a blue string on the front of the plane so that one could pull it across the floor. Go ahead. I was happy. Hold it. I was happy. Read. That following week, she took me and my sister to Dearborn, Michigan, where she occasionally did day work. Day work for the uninformed means black women cleaning up white folks' homes. Go ahead. Dearborn, Michigan is where many of the movers and shakers who controlled the automobile industry lived. Y'all know about that, right? Detroit, the, the Motor City, what they call it. Go ahead. What I quickly noticed was that they lived differently. Hold it. What I quickly noticed is that the white people live differently than the black people. Listen now. Go ahead. There were no five and dime stores in Dearborn at this time. Mm -hmm. There were craft shops. Stop. There were no five and dime stores in that area, but instead there were craft shops. Some people, some people might not even pick up on what's being said here. What is it about a craft shop? What goes on in a craft? What, what are craft shops? Let me just ask that question. What are craft shops? Say it again. Woodwork, okay, metalwork, stuff like that, all right? Keep reading. This is where the white mothers and fathers brought, bought their children airplanes in boxes. So, wait a minute. So, in the craft shops, the white mothers would take their sons and take their children to the craft shops where they would buy what? Airplanes in boxes. They would buy airplanes in boxes. Go ahead. In the boxes were wooden parts. Inside the boxes were wooden parts. Go ahead. Directions for assembly. Directions for assembly. Go ahead. Glue and small engines. Sm glue and small engines. Go ahead. Generally, the sun would assemble the plane. Generally, the white suns would assemble the plane. Go ahead. Which might take a day or two. Which might take a day or two. It's not immediate gratification. There's a lot going on in this statement. It's work, pain, and labor. Go ahead. And then take the plane outside and... Guess what? It would fly. That it would fly. Read. This small slice of life is an example of the development, quite early, 
of two different consciousnesses. Of two different mindsets. That's what we were showing when Captain Amaziah sent that picture with that flag, the brother holding the flag. That's one level of consciousness. The other is understanding what that flag really meant. Showing you that two people who had different educations and different upbringings could look at one particular thing and come up with something totally different. Here the, here's a white child getting a, a, a box with parts in it with glue that he has to build and it's going to take him time to do it. But the black man, he gets the, he gets the, well, it's going to tell you as we read on down. Come on. In my case, and that of other poor Where youths. Where you at now? Where you at now? Pointing. In my case, and that of other poor youths. Another poor black youth would have the same inferior education. Come on. We would buy the plane already assembled. We would buy the plane already assembled. Go ahead. Take it home. Take it home. And hope it rolled on the floor. And hope that it rolled on the floor when I pulled it with my string. That's the extent. You, can, you give this man reparations, he ain't going to do nothing but maybe put rims on the wheels of the plane. Because his education won't go beyond that what he was trained being in pain i'm gonna when i dig into that then when i dig into that scripture you're gonna see what i'm talking about but these are some of the realities that we have to do to be in pain pain has pain has a benefit because that's what i'm gonna talk about i want to talk about the benefit of pain i'm gonna get into it come on take it home and hope it rolled on the floor we hope that it rolled on the floor come on as if it was a car or a truck rather as than if a plane it was a car or a truck instead of a plane Go ahead. In Dearborn, the family would invest. Hold it. The family would do what? Invest in a learning toy. And he, the family would invest in a learning toy. Go ahead. And the child would put in, put it together. That to involves time. That involves, there's a whole lot involved. I used to build models when I was young. So that's why I quickly gravitated to this. I had to do just like, I had to buy model trucks, model airplanes. So, so I know the value in that. I actually learned a good level of mechanics by, build, by working with uh, models, you know, trucks and all that kind of stuff. I learned a lot about those, about engines and all of that. Go ahead. Through this process, the child would learn work ethics? The child would learn work ethics. Let's talk about that. Because if you got to take time to put effort into building this thing that means you have to use your time wisely if i'm looking to have this thing to fly in two days that means i have to i have to be disciplined with the same amount of time that i have that everybody else have everybody have 24 hours in every day you feel me but how am i going to use my minutes to get what i want that's where the discipline comes in that means i can't be out here partying i can't be this and any other no nope, i need to fix focus my mind on building because one day i want this to fly but if I don't have any kind of skills, any kind of thinking like that, I'll go party all day because the only thing I'm looking to do is go home and drag the plane across the floor with the wheels. I don't have to invest any time because it's already built. You see how sick this thing is? This is the mess that we're in. Read. Through this process, the child would learn work ethics. He would learn work ethic. He would learn work ethics. Discipline. Priority. He would learn that I have to prioritize. Okay, I'm going to use these hours to, to, to set aside so that I could do this. That's discipline. That's decision making. Go ahead. And science and math principles. And math principles. Go ahead. And as a result of all that, the plane would fly. And as a result of all of that, the plane would fly. So when he's done with all of that work, he can sit back and appreciate the work of his hands. Y'all feel me? And this is the way, this is the reason why I talk to y'all the way I talk to y'all. Like when I talk about what's coming here and doing this work here, a lot of times people don't have that vision. You got to think like that. You got to put, you got to put some, some time in your thinking and say, by this time we want to have that done. And this time we want to have that done. And slice out the time for that. That means you got to trim the BS. Trim the garbage. I got to, I got to remove frolic and stupidness. So that I can make ways, so that I can make sure that we get this done, we get that done, so we can get these things done. And when it's done, when it's finished, the hard work, we sit and we sit back. Oh, Lord, look, it paid off. That's a good feeling. 
I remember when I used to finish putting the trucks together, and, uh, and I mean very little, teeny parts. When I would finish it, I'd look at them like, wow. Mm. So I know, I know the value of that. You feel me? Okay, read on. I was learning to be a consumer who depended on read others. Read up above that. Yeah, you, you're hitting the points right now. Read up above that. Yes, where, sir. Where you at? Mark, it, mark and, where he's at. And yes, sir. Yeah, right, right. As a result? And the, as a result of all that, the plane would fly. Because the person put the time, the diligence, the discipline to make sure that, that, that the plane flew. So now, on the other hand, with him, what was he doing? I was learning to be a consumer. Who he was learning to be a consumer. That's black people. One point, how much trillions of dollars? 1.4 trillion. This is all of us. 1.4 trillion dollars in consumerism. Damn it. Go ahead. I was learning to be a consumer who depended on others to build the plane for me. Damn. I'm waiting for you to bring, bring me a car. You bring me a house. You bring me this. You bring me that. And I'll just sit here and wait for it. What's the matter, boss? We sick? It's the same thing. Go ahead. The child in Dearborn made an investment, worked on it, and through his labor and brain power. Through his labor and brain power. Through his discipline. Through his making proper decisions, not being tempted to go party and play when I got a job to do. Because my goal is to make these pieces of plastic fly. Go ahead. Through his labor and brain power. Through his labor and brain power. Hold it now. Being pain and labor. This is what we're talking about. Pain and labor. Come on. Through his labor and brain power, produced a plane that flew. Go ahead. Translating this to the larger world. Now he says, so I'm going to use a small example to bring it up to where we are today. Translating that scenario, that reality, to what's going on today. Like my brothers were saying, check cashers. Come on. Translating this to the larger world, I was being taught to buy and to use my body from the neck down. Damn, a pure worker. I was being trained to use my body from the neck down. Your education, all of that teaches you how to go to work. Put the finishing touches on your universities and your colleges, and you come out with your paper, and you say, can I have a job? Go ahead. While the white upper class boy was being taught very early to prepare himself to build things and run things using the neck up. Do you see that? The using the neck up. Go ahead. Two different worlds. My world depending on depending on and working for others, and his world controlling his own destiny. Did y'all see that? But from the educational, how we think makes the difference between whether you're going to set up and you be the creator, you be the owner, you be the, the formulator. You be the one that, that puts vision in your mind and use the things outside to manifest what's in your head. Like I was talking about in some classes back. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to think like this. This is how we're supposed to think. God gave us that ability. The same way that God created the heavens and the earth, it was in God's thoughts first. Then he took the elements and created what was in his mind. And then I would say, he said, let us make man. And man was formulated to do the same thing. When man was born, when man was made, when God made Adam, Adam was given the ability to know how to go inside the earth to produce a chair, to produce a house to cover shame, to produce everything, all of the things that he needed. They were not in existence before Adam put it in his mind. It had to be inside Adam's mind before he used his hands to bring out the elements of the earth to actually create what was in his mind. I have faith in my head that I want a chair. But faith without works is dead. Faith without discipline is dead. Faith without dedication is dead. But with that faith, he says, well, let me use the discipline to use my hands to extract what's in the earth to produce what's in my head. So now when I talk to Adam, I say, Adam, what do you got? Adam says, well, I have a chair that's in my head. He said, well, hell, I don't see that. I don't, for, for, I don't know what you're talking about. 
What do you mean you want to build a school? We don't see no school yet. Like a lot of these camps out here. Like a lot of people that say they want to be this and be that, and they just talk, but they ain't doing a damn thing. But it's until you do something, then the people can say, okay, now I see what you was thinking in your mind. But if you don't never put, if, if it's in your mind and you don't put hands to make what's in your mind work, you ain't saying nothing. Faith without the works is dead because I cannot see what's in your head. I can only see when you, when you materialize what's in your head to bring it into existence. Now I can see what you were thinking. You follow me? Yes, sir. All praises. So that's the point on that. Let's go back to the scripture. Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth. So now we want to talk about being in pain. Be in pain. We read the whole scripture. We read 10 and 11, but now I'm going through it piece by piece. What is this pain? Pain of the mind. Meaning looking at the reality that caused us not to evolve as a people excluding the small steps that I spoke about earlier with the civil rights and things of that nature, right? Uh, despite these small steps, we are still relatively in the same predicament, essentially, that was of 1963 in terms of how we think as a collective. And this is where our collective thinking is essentially today. In other words, we haven't really progressed. Y'all all right? So we have to be in pain to fix that. Now, Still dealing with pain. The feeling of pain. I, I had to write this because I want to make sure I said this correctly. The feeling of pain. Read that scripture again. Like I said, I'm going to stay in the scripture for a while. Read it again. Be in pain. Stop. I'm going to get to the labor later. But right now I'm dealing with pain. The feeling of pain is given to us by God. There is a reason for pain. God wants us to acknowledge pain because there is a benefit to pain. Believe me. When you experience pain, what do you do? Think of pain in your teeth. Y'all all right? When you have pain in your teeth, what does that pain tell you? It tells you that something is wrong with the condition of your teeth. If you choose to ignore it, it gets much worse. Y'all all all right? Yes, sir. Pain has a reason. God put pain in our history for us to go back and look at, what, look at the pain, and therefore the pain will motivate you to labor for righteousness. But if you ignore pain, if you take painkillers, if you take, at, uh, uh, you want to ignore it, you want to get high, you want to get drunk, you ain't going to do nothing but wake up in a stupor still with a damn toothache. You feel me? So there's a reason for the pain. Okay? If you ignore it, it gets much worse. And it can even, in some cases, lead to death in some cases. Y'all know, so, some toothaches, I've heard about it. They said that some toothaches can actually lead you to death, abscesses and poison in the, in the root and all that other stuff, right? Give me my video, painkillers, okay? Because if we choose, before you play it, because if we choose to use painkillers, you only silence the alarm clock of the pain, and you end up ignoring the cause of the pain. Let me say that again. Pain is an alarm clock that seeks to get your attention. Please pay attention to me because there's an abscess in our history. There's an abscess in our growth. There's an abscess in my past. And I don't want to face it. I don't want to deal with it. But you ignore it. But because I ignored the footsteps... I end up going back into it because I never paid attention that the footsteps were behind me. Pain is a reminder. Pain is an alarm clock. Come deal with me quick. You feel me? The reason why we are the way we are now is because of the things that happened to us in history, the way we think. The exaggerated startle response, post-TSD, uh, uh, and also post-traumatic slave syndrome. All of these things have a, have a way of... of, of curtailing our progress. It gets in our way. And if we don't go back and, em and embrace and find out exactly what happened, how it happened, we know that we broke the commandments, yes. But you have to go deeper into it. Because we'll be told, I'm going to use this as an example. I wrote this down. I'm glad I'm, I'm about to say it. If we just give a loose, I guess I call it generic answer, 
Why do we go into slavery and, and the consequences of slavery, somebody might say, oh, we broke the commandments, right? And they'll just leave it at that. But if you don't bring the consequences, are you going to be fearful of keeping the commandments? If you don't know that the condition for breaking the commandments is going to lead to that painful tooth? You'll follow me. You have, to, you have to understand why the commandments are important. What helps us to understand the importance of the commandments? Pain for the consequences of breaking the commandments. That's the point. Y'all all right? So when we choose to ignore the pain, you're not helping the situation at all. A lot of people say, well, I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the commandments. I'm going to keep the commandments. But if there's no pain behind the behind the uh, breaking of the commandments, you will be tempted to break them, especially in this wicked society. With all this temptation out here, you'll be, you, you will be encouraged to break it, and you will have no, uh, uh, no fence to prevent you from doing it. You will have no pushback. Pain is pushback. I know if I stick my hand in that fire, I'm going to get burned. If we know that, that breaking the commandments of God is going to cause us to get burned, I'm going to have enough sense to not go there because I know what pain feels like. But if you're going to ignore the pain, you give me painkillers where I can't feel my arm burning up. Next thing you know, I pull back a damn shoulder and I ain't got nothing else. Because I ignored the pain. I took a painkiller that killed the pain where I couldn't feel it. That's how we are in church. Don't show me that. Don't tell me about that history. Don't show me that stuff. It's the same mess. Y'all all right? Play this. Painkillers. Painkillers just deal with the pain, but it doesn't deal with the cause of the pain. Christianity does the same thing. It doesn't deal with the reason why we went into the church in the first place. It, uh, it only causes us to feel good for the moment, but we come back out and our homes are still broken. Our children are still out of order. Our men are still being sent to jails in, rec in record numbers. The problems that still surround us in this, as a society are never Pause addressed. It. But while we're in the church... Right, that. Stop right there. Unemployment is still there. Drug addiction is still there. Mental illness is still there. Homelessness is still there. And literacy is still there. Because we're not paying attention to the cause of it all. But painkillers causes you not to look at what brought these problems up, but they just kill the pain immediately. That's basically like what we're talking about with the man with the airplane. It takes pain to him to have to have to dedicate hours on building this thing here. He had to do that. But on the other end is immediate gratification. That's a painkiller. You don't want to go through the, the, the you don't want to go through the time it takes to get rid of the pain through, through the right way to get rid of the pain, meaning addressing the problem. To address the problem, that's how you alleviate the pain. But what we're taught to, is to mask it, don't pay attention to it, and then it grows up to be an as, ab, what they call it, an abscess in the tooth? Abscess. It growing and it becomes much worse. But you kill the pain so you enjoy it. You enjoy your freedom, your liberty for a moment. That's, that's, that's essentially what's happening immediate gratification rather than rather than investing in the hard work to really deal with the real problem okay play on but while we're in the church we forget about it for that moment so that's the same thing that a, a painkiller does it kills the pain for the moment but because the cause of the pain is never addressed the pain constantly reoccurs the problem constantly reoccurs because we don't address the cause of it it kills the pain for the moment. But because the conditions are still the same, it's going to come back again. That's the point. Y'all all right? Yes, Let's go back to this scripture again. Yes, sir. Micah chapter 4 and verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth. So the pain, again, is, is us paying attention to the consequences that will keep us in the right direction. Now, I'm going to move on. Just hang with me. Okay, so in order to labor properly, we must know exactly where our problem is. And this is where the pain comes in. Yes, we must keep the commandments. But, these com but keeping those commandments won't be seen as an absolute must unless 
which it is, because keeping the commandments is a must, we must do it. But it won't, it won't merely be the answer unless we clearly understand the consequences of not keeping the commandments. It's like telling a man or a woman that they are commanded to brush their teeth after every meal. You could tell them all day long. Will they listen? They, they might listen. They might not listen. But if they understood that there was a consequence for not brushing their teeth and they start getting that pain in the mouth, that pain in the mouth, they will remember because that's history. They will remember. You know what? I better listen to that because I don't want to go through that pain again. That's what Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, is all about. That's how that works. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so like I said, but if you don't give them the understanding of the consequences for, for when they don't brush their teeth, it will, like I said, form into that abscess and everything else. Okay. The consequences are indeed painful. Nevertheless, they are indeed necessary for us all to know. So what causes us to acknowledge the actions of our misbehaviors? Pains and judgments is what does that. Pains and judgments. This is what causes us to understand the value of pain. As children, we understand this with our parents as, they, as when they chastise us for the misbehaviors that we've caused them. You remember when you were kids, right? Some of us. Some of us, I hope everybody got a beating at some point or another. Y'all all right? So we remember those things. If we were not chastised, if we were not chastened, we grew up not learning the consequences. Of a child, let they call them spoiled, him or her spoiled. If they don't learn the value of being chastised, they will grow up and think that there's no consequence for anything they do and end up dead. Y'all follow me? Just like those who take the painkillers and they ignore the alarm of what our disobedience would further lead us into. Now you have no teeth. Okay, because you didn't listen to the pain, you end up nothing but gums. Because you've ignored the pain, which would have sent you to the dentist. You would have said, I better learn how to take care of this before I end up with no teeth. But if you have no pain to remind you at all, you be comfortable, and the next thing you know, all your teeth fall out because you've ignored the pain. You took a painkiller rather than valuing the pain, right? Hosea 5.15. Let's read out the Bible now. Hosea 5.15. Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. I will go and return to my place. God says that he will go and he will return and go to his place. Till go ahead. They, till, until, go ahead. Till they acknowledge their offense. Until we acknowledge our offense. Our offense is us breaking the commandments of God. Go ahead. And seek my face. And, 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 and when he leaves us, it's a hope that by him leaving us, it will cause us to seek his face. In other words, look for the alarm. Pay attention to the alarm clock. Go ahead. In their affliction. Affliction is pain. In your pain. They Go will, ahead. They will seek me early. That's what's going to make us come and keep the commandments. In our pain, in our affliction, we will seek God early. So you're not going to really do any kind of labor work if you're not pushed to do it. Because labor is work. Like the man building the plane, that's work. He would love to be able to just immediately get a gratification and, some, and fly a plane that's already built. You feel me? But he had, to, he had to say, you know what? It's worth me putting some pain in sitting and putting time in and labor and building this thing. Read it again. I will go and return to my place. Go ahead. Till they acknowledge their offense. Go ahead. And seek my faith. That's what we are set to do. Go ahead. In their affliction, they will seek me early. In our affliction, we will seek God early. I'm going to talk a little bit more about pain as I move on. Like I'm saying, I'm still in that scripture. Affliction is the pain. And the pain is what, is what motivates our labor. Pain. Is what motivates our labor. If you're looking at pain and you decide to not do anything, you'll end up going into the garbage. You'll end up destroying yourselves. 
But if you know that, that if the pain is on you and you don't want to continue to feel that pain, you will do something to get you out of that, and that's called labor. If we go back and look at the atrocities that we went through and realize how it messed us up, we will have no choice but to say we got to do something about this. Let us restore the decayed state of our people, like it says in the scriptures, because they were looking at the pain of the nation of Israel being destroyed. I'm talking about during the Maccabean period. Y'all all right? So now I'm going to give you another example of how pain motivates or how it's supposed to motivate and what happens when painkillers are introduced where you ignore the pain and the problems persist. Some of us choose to ignore the pain like women during childbirth. Y'all all right? When I say choose to ignore it, they get what they call it, epidorium, epidurals, uh, different kinds of pains, th things to mask the pain, right? God gave you that pain for a reason. We're going to read about it. We're going to read about it. <clears throat> Some of us ignore the pain like women during childbirth. God gave that pain to women as a reminder that they are to be obedient to their husbands. That's the reason why God gave them that pain. So that is a reminder for them to remember how they messed up. Now, this is just this little part is just going to deal with the women, but I'm going to get back to the men. You feel me? But I got to get both sides. Y'all real? And this is not, this is not, this should be loved because it is the consequences of us not doing this is what's jacking us up. Y'all all right, sisters? All right. Give me Timothy's. First Timothy's 2 and 11. We're going to read that, and then we're going to read Genesis 3. And I'm going I'm to ready to turn it up just a little bit, and then we're going to go back to, well, we're going to go back to uh, Micah. Like I said, we're going to deal with that. Now, we, we're still talking about pain. I ain't even get to the labor yet. You got it? Yes, sir. Read. First Timothy chapter 2 and verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence. With all subjection. That's what the Most High said for the women to learn from their husband in silence, not no back talk. The man is talking righteous. He's telling you what to do out of the scriptures. They're not supposed just to, because somebody be like, well, what if, what if, what if? But you don't do this on the job. The white man says, clean my windows with newspaper. And you in there cleaning it. That ain't even in your job description. But when your husband asks you something, you got a problem. That ain't what we read in here. Read that again. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Meaning that there's no back talk. There's no lip. No, none of that. Read. But I suffer not a woman to teach. This is what the subject matter is. She's not supposed to be over the man. Who set this up? God. Go ahead. Nor to usurp authority over the man. But to be in silence. Meaning, because he, he's telling you to do right by the scriptures, you're supposed to follow that. Read on. For Adam was first formed. For Adam was first formed. Then Eve. Then Eve. So Adam was made first, and then Eve came from Adam. And then from there, all, everybody else came from Eve. That's how that goes. Okay. Read on. And Adam was not deceived. Adam was not deceived. Why wasn't Adam not deceived? Because Adam was already a God, meaning a power in the earth. God made him that way. He made him Lord over the earth when you read in the scriptures. Whom thou madest Lord of all thy creatures. So Adam was already a God. Go ahead. And Adam was not deceived. Go ahead. But the woman being deceived. Well, how, how was a woman deceived? By Satan to be above Adam. That was her deception. She wanted to be above Adam. That's the reason why the Lord sold her. She must learn in silence. Go ahead. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. She was in this transgression of listening to Satan to go against her husband. Read on. Notwithstanding. Notwithstanding. All the, we understand all of what we just read, but this is to be, this is to purely be understood. Read it again. Notwithstanding. Go ahead. She shall be saved in childbearing. This is what we get into. She shall be saved in childbearing. Go ahead. If they continue in if, faith. If they continue in faith 
in charity and holiness with sobriety. With sobriety, meaning I'm going to follow what the Most High said. If she does that, she's going to be saved. If she's running her mouth trying to be over her man, she's not going to be saved. Simple as that. Genesis chapter 3. You got, a lot of, you got a lot of women that be with their big mouths driving their husbands crazy. And they think they're going to get the kingdom. No, you're, you're going to get death. That's what you're going to get. Jer uh, Genesis 3 verse 16. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16. I'm still dealing with the pain now. Watch this. Unto the woman, he said. Unto the woman, he said. I will this is Eve, same Eve. Go ahead. I will greatly mul multiply thy sorrow. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. What am I bringing out? The pain that the Most High introduced and the reason why he did it. I'm still talking about the value and the gift of pain. It is to remind us. Read that again. I will greatly multiply thy sorrow. Come on. And thy conception. In your conception when you're having babies. Come on. In sorrow. Thou shalt bring forth children. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children. Meaning screaming and hollering. Pain, pain, pain. It is to remind you of what you didn't do. Because you weren't supposed to have it like this. But the most I say, I'm going to give you a constant reminder. Every time you have a baby, it's, gonna, it's supposed to remind you of your disobedience against your husband. But here, here goes the medical field. Give them painkillers. Give them epidural. Give them different things so that they don't feel the pain. And you will never understand the value of why God gave the pain, which is going to continue to allow, which is going to allow you to continue to be disobedient to your husband. And then that abscess and that toothache is going to be your death. Y'all understand? Yes, sir. That's how that goes. God gave you that so that it could remind you, I better listen to my husband. Read that again. Yes, sir. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Come on. And thy desire shall be to thy husband. And your desire shall be to your husband. And he shall rule over thee. That's what the pain is supposed to remind you of. It's supposed to remind you that your desire is to be to your husband. And he, your husband, shall rule over you. That's how that goes, okay? Bishop Kanai rightfully points out about women during childbirth, and I thought it was the most profound and accurate thing I ever heard concerning this subject. And I've heard nobody else say this. And he should know. He's had, he got like 12 or 14 of them now. So his, he even heard screams and every octave and, you know, all about that. So I, he's qualified to make the statement. I'm going to repeat it. Bishop Kanai rightfully points out about women during childbirth. This is what he said. He said, you are absolutely in the most vulnerable position ever in your life when you are in childbirth, period. Let me elaborate on that. That is the weakest point of your whole existence when you're actually in the middle of childbirth. There ain't a damn thing you could do if the house catch on fire there's nothing, you can't stop it. You there and you got to be there until it's finished. Can I get a witness, say, sisters? Uh, they, <laughs> they, they remember that pain. They said, damn, he's talking and I feel the pain coming along me. Y'all all right? But that's the point there. And God gave you that excruciating pain in that childbirth to remind you of the commandment to obey your husband. But if you are given painkillers where you don't feel that, you will continue to be like you're over your husband. And that's going to get you jammed up. The scripture says she shall be saved in childbearing. In that childbearing, you're supposed to remember this. Y'all all right? Can you dig it? All right. Uh, 17. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. And unto Adam he said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is, cur cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of so thy life. So because Adam messed up. Adam hearkened. Read that again. And unto Adam. And unto Adam he said. 
Because thou has hearkened unto the voice because of Because you listened to your wife. When it was supposed to be you teaching her, she ended up teaching you. She ended up usurping authority over you. And that's out of order with the Lord. So the Lord said, because of that, I'm going to give you some pain. To have you remember. Give you some pain now. Read. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And sorrow shall thou eat of it all the days of our lives. We're going to work our butts off now. Read on. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Mm -hmm. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Go ahead. And the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. And in the, read that verse again. And in the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread. Meaning now we got to work, work, work. When it was given to us in the beginning. Now we got to bust our asses. Read. Till thou return unto the ground. Until you die. So every time we work, this is a reminder to us that we should not be listening to our wives. That's why Bishop Kanai says that a lot of times, and I agree with him. I don't want to hear a whole bunch of foolishness. If it ain't that Bible, just be quiet. Because a lot of times it's going to turn you into something else. Men need time to think on manly stuff. I don't want to hear no, no women stuff, man. No, I need to keep my mind on war. Trying to get the kingdom. Y'all understand what I'm saying? Now, I ain't, now, I don't I ain't tell us to be a nigga now. I ain't talking about that. She can't say nothing. I got, every time I say, I want to come to him and I ain't, I ain't got no scripture. Oh, you can speak. Y'all all right? But y'all dig what I'm saying. Don't be getting carried off into them conversations that they be having most of the time. Because most of the time it ain't righteous. You feel me? And I know that for a fact. We all know that. Let's stop BSing. Read on. <laughs> yes, sir. For out of it was thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shall thou return. What ver you, uh, okay, you're going to 20 now. Read on. Verse 20. And, and Adam called to Now, I'm still dealing with pain now. Watch, just watch how it goes. Stay with me. And I hope y'all taking good notes. Are y'all uh, Y'all taking good notes? Y'all following me? I didn't lose anybody, right? When I go back to uh, Micah, y'all going to be all right? Okay, read on. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. And Adam called his wife's name Eve. He named her. He named her Eve. He got, he, he got his sense back after getting that butt whipping by the Most High. Okay, you're going to work your ass off forever. You feel me? That kind of helped shape him up. He said, okay, let, let me get this thing straight. Your name is Eve. Go ahead. He named her woman. He got his, he got his stuff together. Read. Because she was the mother of all living. That because everybody came from her. That's the point that it's saying there. You follow me? She came from Adam, and from Adam, everybody came from her. Cain and Abel and all the rest of the people, they all came from Eve. That's how that goes. You feel me? Read on. Give me the fourth chapter. No, no, no. Keep reading. Keep reading. 20, 21. Verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Hold it. This is hip talk here. And un unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God Make coats of skins and clothe them. That's when the law of sacrifice was introduced. The coats of skins was talking about the animals. I'm going to prove it. But the very next, when you just read on to the fourth chapter, it's going to prove that what we just said is what it is. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Sisters, y'all all right? Read on. Read 4 and 1. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. And Adam knew Eve, his wife. He had sex with her. And she conceived. And she conceived. Go ahead. And bear came. And bear came. Go ahead. And said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So Cain was born first. Read on. And she again bear his brother Abel. And she again bear his brother Abel. Now, at this time period, not only, it's only mentioned in Cain and Abel, but a whole lot of other kids were being born at this time. But it's only mentioned in those two because these are the subject matters of what we read in the Bible. Y'all follow me? Y'all ever heard the term that the Bible is abridged? Huh? The, the, who does not know what it means to say abridged? Like if you get, like if you buy, if you get a concordance, a, 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 a biblical concordance, any, who knows what, a concordance is what? What is a concordance? A biblical concordance. What is a biblical concordance? 
A biblical concordance is is a book with that has every word of the Bible in it. So whenever you're looking for a word, you can go into it and it tells you where that verse is. You can look a series of words and it'll tell you how to find uh, particular uh, verses and so forth. Then you have something that's called an exhaustive concordance. Exhaustive, that's what it means with every word in it. Okay, if you find something that says an abridged dictionary, that's another one. You've seen that word before. A bridge dictionary means that it doesn't have every word in it. It just has keywords or mainly important words. That's, that's what it means when it says abridged. What I'm saying here is that there's a lot of information, what we're reading here, that is abridged, but it's bringing out the pertinent parts, like it's mentioned in Cain and Abel. Uh, Adam and Eve had way more than in, uh, Cain and Abel. Okay, when you read on down in this chapter, it proves it because when it got to the point where Adam, where Cain messed up and it says, everyone that findeth me, where was the rest of these people going to come from? They came from Adam and Eve. Okay, but it's not mentioning them there, just like it didn't mention them when Cain was worried. We're going to read that. Everybody's with me? Yes, sir. Sisters, y'all with me? I think I lost. I think I've. How many of y'all are confused at this point? Hands up. Be honest. Huh? I lost I lost him at Timothy. Oh, oh, they ain't like that. Damn, I lost him at Timothy. Damn. <laughs> oh boy. Uh read, 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 read. Yes, sir. Genesis chapter 4, <laughs> verse, verse 2. And she again bare his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. Read on. And in process of time, it came to pass. That Cain brought of the fruit of the ground. So in the process of time, a lot of things happened during the process of time. Kids were being born. Other, all these people were coming out. There's a lot. Remember, these people lived very long in their years back then. Read. And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Why am I reading this? Because I'm proving that that coat of skin meant sacrificing of animals. Read that verse again. And in process of time, it came to pass Go ahead. that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Cain brought a fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Read on. And Abel. So he, his brother Abel. He also brought of the firstlings of his flock. He also bought of the coats of skin, so you can understand. That's what's happening here. He also bought of the what? The firstlings of his flock. Go ahead. And of the fat thereof. Go ahead. And the Lord had respect unto Abel. And he had respect unto Abel because Abel followed what his father taught him. Go ahead. And to his offering. And to his offering because that's according to how his father taught him. Go ahead. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. But unto Cain and his offering, God had not respect because you disobeyed. Read on. And Cain was very wroth. So and this dude, this is how the white man is today. This, the seed of Cain is Esau today. They think the same exact way. Read. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And his countenance fell. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto Cain. He getting mad knowing what his father taught him, and he disobeyed what his father said, and he going to get mad because he's getting checked on it. That's exactly how these people are today. Judgment is going to come on them, and they acting like it ain't supposed to come on them when they done raped, robbed, and murdered, and pillaged this whole planet. And they think they're not supposed to get justice. Why is this happening to me? The hell? Read. And the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth? And why is thy continent fallen? Why are you mad? Go ahead. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If you would have done well like your father taught you, you would have been accepted like your brother was accepted. Read. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And if you don't do well, Satan lies at your door. Meaning you're going to be the, you're going to be the, the physical counterpart of the spiritual demon Satan. That's what it means. That's why we call them the children of the devil. Read. And unto, unto thee shall be his desire. And unto Satan shall be your desire. And, thou and unto Satan shall be the white man's desire. Just like unto, unto Eve's husband shall be her desire. Her, she's supposed to get all of her desires met through her husband. Cain and Cain's seed is going to get their desires met through Satan. 
Read. And thou shall rule over him. And Satan shall rule over him. Damn, that's deep. That's all throughout the scriptures, Revelation and all that. And, his, and Revelation says, and the great dragon gave him his seat and great authority. Because Satan is what's ruling this white man. Go ahead, read. Verse 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, Go and ahead. slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Come on. And he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Mm -hmm. And now art thou cursed from the earth, Go ahead. which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother. So the spirit of Abel was crying unto the father. Like when you read in the book of Revelation, when it talks about the souls. Give me that real quick. Give me that in Revelation uh, 6. Was it 6 or 9? What is it? 6 and 9, right? Let's read that. The spirit is crying out to the father. It's important for me to read this as I read on. Revelations chapter 6 Thank and you. verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. So Abel was slain for the word of God because Abel kept the commandments. He brought forth what he was supposed to bring forth. Cain didn't. So what it said here, read it again. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God. That were slain for the word of God. That's how that Cain slew Abel. Okay, go ahead. And for the testimony which they held. Go ahead. And they cried the with a loud. The testimony that he held was to keep the commandments. Read. And they cried with a loud. And the spirits cried. They were slain. Go ahead. And Listen, they, it's going to prove out what it's talking about. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, how holy and true. Does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? That's what the Most High was saying in Genesis. I hear your brother's voice crying out to me. Because that's what was happening here with the, with the, with the Israelite prophets. That's a, like a lot of us was killed. And our souls was crying to the Most High in the spirit world. The Lord hears that. Go back to where we was at in Genesis. Gen Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am Liar. I my brother's he keeper? Knew. Am I my brother's keeper? Listen to, the, listen to the spirit of this dude. Knowing damn well he killed them. Knowing damn well that this white man killed the Native American Indians. We were asked where they at. Oh, they happily on reservations. No, they dead. Go ahead. And he said, what hast thou done? What hast thou done? Come on. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me. That's what we read in Revelation. The voice of thy brother's voice, spirit, is crying out to me. Go ahead. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Read. And now art thou cursed from the earth. Go ahead. Which have opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from, from thy hand. Read. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. That's what's, what is this talking about? This is coming all the way up to now. This man has poisoned the earth. That's what it's talking about. When he, when the, when he goes into the earth, the earth is poisoned. He destroyed it because this earth is supposed to be beautiful. It's not going to yield to her. This earth is not going to yield its true benefits to this beast. That's what's written about when we go back in Jerusalem. It says, for the, it said, the branches shall shoot forth, for Israel is here to come. That's when the earth is going to yield its strength to us when we get back in rulership. Because right now the earth is out of course, all the way up to now. Read on. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. Go ahead. A fugitive and a vagabond shall thy be in the earth. That, I want y'all to remember that part right there. A fugitive and a vagabond shall he be in the earth. Why, why is he a fugitive? It's because he committed a crime and he has not paid for the crime that he committed. He killed his brother Abel. Therefore, there's a judgment that's supposed to come with that. But he's running from justice, so he's a fugitive. Cain. That's going to translate all the way up to Esau. We're going to read it with proof. Y'all all right? Read on. And Cain said unto the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Go ahead. Behold, thou hast driven me out this day from the face of the earth. Because everybody's going to be looking to get him. Read. 
And from thy face shall I be hid. From thy face shall I be hid. I'm going to have to hide myself because with all these people looking for me, I'm going to die. Read. And, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall... Who's going to hold it? Everyone that findeth me. Who's going to find him if, if it's only his mother and father? Abel is dead. Because he killed Abel already. So where's the everyone else that's going to find him? Those were the other people that Eve had. Y'all all right? Y'all all right now? Because yes, I know a lot of y'all were lost. Y'all okay now? All right. They Now, now, now they're perking up. They, I think they got past Timothy. You think they got past Timothy? <laughs> Read that again. <laughs> and, it, and it shall come to pass that everyone that findeth me shall slay me. Shall slay me. Go ahead. And the Lord said unto him. And the Lord said unto him. Go ahead. Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. Therefore, who shall he? He said, therefore, who shall slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. What is that talking about? What is that talking about? The Lord blessed Cain with the weapons. That's the reason why in Obadiah it says, what does it say in Obadiah? It says uh, in the second verse. What does it say in Obadiah? I need it read. Don't quote it because you're quoting it the wrong one. Second verse. Throw me off. Obadiah 2. I'm trying to keep my thought together before, before it leaves. Obadiah verse 2. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. This is Obadiah talking about Esau. I have made you small among the nations. Thou meaning he's... Meaning Nothing. Go ahead. Behold, I have made thee small among the heathen. Thou art greatly despised. Thou art greatly despised. Why is he despised? Because he robbed everybody. All of the nations are trying to get even with him. Y'all see that? So that's so what's keeping read on down, and it's gonna show you why. The pride of thy heart have deceived thee. The pride of his mind have deceived thee because he got the technology and the weapons to keep people off of him. All of the nations that he robbed, you mean to tell me he ain't got caught yet? Because he's got the superior technology and the weapons and the missiles and the what guns and all. He got all of that. You cannot outgun this guy because God gave that to him as a blessing when you read Genesis. Y'all all right? Cool. So now, go back to where we was at. Genesis chapter 4 and verse 15. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him. How is vengeance going to be taken on him? Because he's going to drop bombs on you. That's how that goes. How is vengeance? Anybody that messes with this dude, this dude got all kind of weapons that just obliterate you. But God built, God built him up that way because God is going to ultimately destroy him. So don't get discouraged by what I'm reading. I'm just bringing out the facts. Come on, read. And, and the Lord set a mark upon Cain. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain. Mark meaning inside your forehead. Gave him a mark of technology and weapons. Two ball Cain, so you can understand. Gave him the ability to make weapons. Go ahead. Lest any finding him. Should, Lest any finding him. Should kill him. Shall kill him. So what's keeping him from being killed? He's got the technology to keep people off of him. That's how that goes. Y'all all right? Read on. Oh, uh, give me Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, verse 14. So we was reading that he's a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth, and he's got the technology to keep them away from him. But here in what we're about to read now is when it's going to change. Isaiah 13 and 14. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 14. And it shall be. And it. Shall be. The and it, it, I'm focusing on the it. The it is the white man. The it is Esau. We're going to prove that this chapter is talking about Esau. Read it again. And it shall be as the chase roe. And it, the white man, shall be as a chase deer. Go ahead. And as a sheep. He's also going to be like a sheep. That no man taketh up. Ain't nobody going to be concerned when he gets out of a cab that day. They're going to leave him alone. They're going to be running from him. Y'all feel me? Ain't no gotta, nobody going to be trying to protect him in that day because this is, when that, this is when all of the nations are going to be chasing him. Read that again. And it shall be as the chase roe, and as a sheep that no man taketh up. Come on. They shall every man turn to his 
own people Go ahead. and flee everyone into his own land. Everybody going to be for themselves in that day. All the nations, they're going to turn back to themselves. Go ahead. Everyone that is found. Every one of these Edomites that's found in that day. Shall be thrust through. They're going to stick a sword through him. Go ahead. And everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. And everyone that's talking about some, this is my master, I want to hold on to him, you're going to die with him. That's going to be the day to get the hell away from him. That's going to be the day you got to leave them alone. Let the judgment of God come upon them. That's what this is saying. Where you at? Verse 16. You read, read 16. Come on. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. This is a terrible thing here, man. Their children, some of, some, of our, some of our women didn't have babies by these people. And in that day, they're going to die because those are the seed of Esau. I can't dress that up. That's exactly, we're reading it, and that's what I'm going to give you. Read on. Their houses shall be spoiled. Their houses shall be spoiled. And their wives ravished. And their wives are going to be raped. So the nations are going to do that raping, not the Israelites. I know that's a fantasy of some sick Negroes that want to talk about some. He want to slay with the white woman so bad he want to rape her. Israel ain't going to be doing that at all. The nation's going to be doing that. Rape is against the Bible. Y'all all right? Now, so why shall he be chased? Because all of the nations that he robbed shall narrowly look upon him and consider him saying, is this the seed of Cain, basically? Give me that in Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Well, let's read the law. I'm going to read the law on why they're going to be chasing him. Give me Genesis 9 and 6. Let's read that first. Genesis 9 and 6. No, I need Isaiah first. Then give me Genesis 9 and 6. Isaiah uh, 14, verse 16 or 17, one of them. Isaiah chapter. Isaiah, the 13th chapter and the 14th chapter is talking about the fall of the white man. I'm just saying it in plain English so y'all can understand what it's talking about. Okay. This is the bring, this is his, this is his going down. This is the war, this is the war in the white man's heaven. That's what's going to, that's what's going to be going down. It ain't the most high's heaven at all. We're going to read that next. Read. Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 16. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee saying, is this the man? Is this the big bad white man? That made call the, it, is this the is this the one that we call Jesus? Is this the one that got his churches where all of my generations of my black brothers and sisters was going in there talking about some yes, Jesus left me and they got Charles Manson in their mind? Is this the one? Read it again. They they that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. Let's stop right there. They that see them for what they really are. In other words, we see Esau every day, but what we see is a lens that they gave us. They gave us a lens to look at them as if they're great people. They gave us a lens to look at them as if they're Superman and hunks and beauties and, and the bachelor and all that foolishness. That's how we look at them now, like they're such great people. You'll follow me. Read it again. They that see thee. They that see, when we see him, go ahead. Shall narrowly look upon thee. Narrowly means that we're taking, we're removing the false glasses. To narrowly look meaning that you're straining your eyes and you're really taking a good look and you're examining what he really is. That's what it means to narrowly look upon him. Y'all all right? Read. And consider thee, saying, is this the man? And you are, and we are going to consider him and say what? Is this the man? Is this the man? That made the earth to tremble? That made the earth to tremble with his bombs and his weapons and his technology? Is this the one? That did shake kingdoms? He shook kingdoms with bombs. When he walked into the lands and the other areas, when he stepped on the soil, everybody bowed. Everybody moved out of the way. Everybody was scared and shook when this man showed up. But in that day, it's not going to be like that. Read that. That. Read it again, Bishop? Yes. N not the whole thing, just the last statement. Is this the man that made 
the earth to tremble? Is this the man that made the earth to tremble? Come on. That did shake kingdoms? That did shake kingdoms? Come on. That made the world as a wilderness? That made the world. I mean, who, who, who else is this talking about? That made the world as a wilderness with bombs. He poisoned the water. That's the reason why it said about the earth should not yield their increase. Because he destroyed the ozone layer. He destroyed the water. Destroyed people's minds. Polluted the water, fish coming up out of it because they can't take the water no more. Birds are dropping dead from pollution. This is the man that did this because the earth is not going to yield her strength unto this beast. Go ahead. That made the world as a wilderness. Go ahead. And destroyed cities thereof. Damn, how else, who else is this talking about, class? This is talking about Esau, the white man. Go ahead. That opened not the house of his prisoners? His prisoners is the 12 tribes of Israel and everybody. He put everybody in captivity. Who are we reading about? Esau. Now, Genesis 9 and 6. This is the reason why he's going to get it. Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. By man shall his blood be shed. Did Esau kill the nations? Did yes, he sir. shed their blood? Yes, sir. So what did the Bible say? The Bible says, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Esau have slayed all of the nations. Every nation felt the wrath of Esau. Every nation have suffered multiples of loss. Multiples of destruction, multiples of captivities, multiples of, of destruction and robbery. But what he did to the 12 tribes of Israel was absolutely the 100% worse. All of the rest of the nations got their nationality. They won't even allow us to say ours. We can't even say that we're the Jews. We can't even say it. He got to pay for all of that. He got to pay for all of that. Um, Isaiah, so I was going to prove that, let me prove that, that, uh, that Babylon is America. First verse, Isaiah 13 and 1. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 1. Now I'm dealing with war in heaven. I'm still not done with Micah yet, but time is running. <laughs> time is running. Go ahead. Isaiah 13 and verse 1. Come on. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Come on. Lift ye up a banner upon. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. The burden of Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos did see. Wait a minute. Isaiah was in the Babylonian captivity right then when he was telling this. He was in ancient Babylon. Is everybody with me? But why is the Bible saying that he saw Babylon? Because the Babylon that Isaiah was seeing was not the Babylon particularly where he was at. He was seeing the Babylon that everybody else didn't see. And that's what he was speaking about. It would not make sense to say that he saw the same Babylon that everybody else is in. Y'all dig what I'm saying? For you to say that, read it again. The burden of Babylon. The, the, the trouble, which is the ugly sight for the Most High. Babylon is a burden. The burden of Babylon which Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. So Isaiah saw Babylon. So what Babylon did Isaiah see? He saw the Babylon the Great, meaning he saw that in the vision, and that's what he's prophesying about. Read. Lift ye up a banner upon the high mountain. That's what we are to do in this kingdom here. It's bringing it all the way up to where we are now. Read. Exalt the voice unto them. Exalt the voice unto them, and this is what we're doing when we teach on the street. Go ahead. Shake the hand. Shake the hand with that vehement shaking. Go ahead. That they may go into the gates of the nobles. To make them so upset that we're telling that the Israelites, the black man and the Hispanics and the Native American Indians, they're the Israelites that the Bible speaks of. Now they're talking in their top courts and all of that, trying to stop this truth, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. They're taking this truth all the way up into the society to come against this truth. Come on. I have All of this is involved in pain and labor, by the way. Read. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have commanded my sanctified ones. The sanctified ones are the Israelites that repented. That's us. Sanctified, meaning that we're cleaned up. The scriptures in uh, John 17, is it John 17, 17? 
Well, it says, sanctify them through thy truth. That word is truth. Or is that Matthew? No, John 17, 17. It says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What sanctified us is the word of God, which is the commandments. That's what cleaned us up. That's what sanctified us. When you hear people talking about their sanctified and holy roller, that's bull jive. Sanctification is when you're clean up with God's commandments. Read. I have commanded my sanctified ones. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. So the sanctified ones are the prophets. When we teach on the street, when we teach this word, the angels are activated when we teach this word. Read that third verse again. I have commanded my sanctified ones. The sanctified ones are the prophets, the brothers that's teaching this truth. We are the sanctified ones, and when we're teaching, what happens? I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. He's going to send the angels. The, the, act, the, the, the angels are activated by the words of the prophets. So when the prophets speak the words, the angels back it up. The angels are working on the minds of the men and the women, on the minds of kings, on, 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 on Biden, on Putin, all of that. When we speak about war, God is sending the angels to make them make decisions, to press buttons, to get the, get the war going. That's how God's prophecies come to pass. When the prophets speak, the angels are activated by it, and then they go to work on the minds of men to make sure that the prophecies in this Bible come to pass. Y'all understand that? Yes, sir. That's some heavy stuff there, ain't it? Shows you the power that we have. Give me that in uh, Amos. Amos uh, 6 and 7, right? 6 and 7, I think it is. Amos. Amos chapter 3 and verse 7. Surely. surely Read the, the sixth verse. Verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? That's the prophet's teaching. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? That's that alarm again. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city? The Jews are black. The Israelites are black. Christ is black. The Lord is coming back to save the nation of Israel. That's the trumpet that's being blown. And when the nations hear it, they are afraid. Read it again. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? There's fear coming out when we speak this word. Go ahead. Shall there be evil in a city? So our words is bringing evil to this wicked society. Because the angels are going to bring the evils. It tells you that the Lord is going to send evil angels among them. And the read in the book of Psalms, it says that. By sending evil angels among them. Read it. Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord have not done it? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord have not done it? Listen now. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. But he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. So unless the Lord sends his prophets to secrets, the Most High's angels ain't going to do anything. That's what I just told you. Read that statement again. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Surely the angels will not be activated to do anything. Go ahead. But he revealeth his secrets. His secrets is us with the prophecies. That's what the secrets are. His secrets are the prophecies that you hear the brothers teaching. Like Deacon Malachi be bringing them prophecies out. Bishop Nathaniel. The brothers be bringing those prophecies out. And when those prophecies are going out, the angels are activated. Y'all understand what we're reading? Read that again. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. But he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. So your church members ain't going to get this. Your preachers in church ain't going to get this. It's only going to come from the Israelite prophets, which are the sanctified ones. Y'all understand what we're reading? The sanctified ones are the ones that's going to bring this. And when they teach it, the angels are going to move according to the words that the prophets speak. That's the reason why... They're angry with us because they know that when we speak, the angels move. Go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 3. I have commanded my sanctified ones. That's the prophets. He revealed his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Those are the sanctified ones. Go ahead. I have also called my mighty ones for my anger. I have also called my mighty ones to back up the sanctified ones because when they, when they speak, the angels move. Go ahead. Even them that rejoice in my highness. The angels rejoice in God's highness with all that power. Read. The noise of a multitude in the mountains. Uh, the noise of confusion in the governments. That's what the mountains means. It means the nations are arguing about the Israelites waking up. They're arguing about the 12 tribes of Israel gathering themselves together through pain and labor. Read. Like as of a great people. Like as of a great people. There's a whole lot of nations like we was reading in Psalms, the 83rd chapter. There's a whole lot of nations that want to keep the Israelites in slavery. Go ahead. A tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. 
The Lord of hosts mustereth the hosts of the battle. Who's doing this? The Most High. The Lord of hosts is starting the fight. The Lord of hosts is mustering the host of the battle. God is causing this. Read. They come from a far country. It's talking about now the weapons and the missiles. This is what we're reading about now. They come from a far country. Go from, ahead. from the end of he heaven. Meaning that's me. He's going to send terrorists over here. That's what, the, that's what this is saying. He's going to send all kinds of plagues right here. Go ahead. Even the Lord. Even the Lord is coming. And the weapons of his indignation. And the weapons of God's indignation. What is the weapons of God's indignation? We're going to read it before we close out. The weapons of God's indignation are those nuclear intercontinental ballistic missiles. Right. That he caused the nations to build. Read. To destroy the whole land. To destroy the whole what? The whole land. Is there an S on that? No, sir. That means 100% of this country is going to go up in smoke. To destroy the whole land. Singular. So that's the Babylon that Isaiah was talking about. He was not talking about ancient Babylon. They didn't have Babylon. The ancient kingdom of Babylon didn't get none of this. Read. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. How ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. The day of the Lord was not at hand in ancient Babylon. The day of the Lord is close now in this Babylon the great. Go ahead. This it, is what Isaiah was talking about. Read. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. It, the day of the Lord, shall come as a destruction from God. That's going to happen in this Babylon the great. Let's prove it. Give me the 19th verse. Isaiah chapter 13. Same chapter. In verse 19. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. And Babylon, the same one that Amos, the same one that Isaiah saw. And Babylon, go ahead. The glory of kingdoms. The glory of kingdoms because she robbed everybody else with their weapons and with their protection because God gave them that mark to protect them, to keep the nations from getting him. The mark of Cain, so you can understand. These people got it. Read. The beauty of the Chaldees. The beauty. What made them beautiful? Robbery. She's decked out with precious pearls and diamonds when you read Revelation. That's what I said. Her excellency. They got their missiles. They got their weapons. They got all of that. Riches, everything. Read. Excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. How did God overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? By fire. That's how Babylon going to be destroyed. Read that again. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. How did God overthrow Sodom and Gomorrah? Let's read the scripture. Let's read it. Let's find out how in case somebody don't know. That's how the Lord is going to destroy this Babylon the Great. And we're in, we're in Babylon the Great right now. You're in it. It's not in Iraq. Nineteen twenty-four, Genesis nineteen twenty-four. Thank you. Genesis chapter nineteen and verse twenty-four. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Brimstone and fire is what burnt up Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to bring brimstone and fire to burn up this place here. Where's that fire going to come from? Nuclear weapons. We're going to read about it. And after that, I got to do a part two. I ain't going. Ain't no way in the world I'm going to finish this class. Because it's already coming up on 9 o'clock, so I'm going to read that, and then we're going to close out for the night. Y'all all right? Then I'll give y'all the next one the next time I teach. Uh, where we at? You read it? Yes, go, go, back to Isaiah, go back to where you was reading, 19, and I want 20. I want both. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 19. I'm proving that the, that the Babylon that Isaiah was teaching was, was prophesying again against was Babylon the great where we are now, and not necessarily the Babylon that he was in. Because that was a vision that the Lord gave him, and he saw this kingdom. Read. In Babylon, the glory of kingdoms. Which is Babylon the great, the glory of kingdoms, come on. The beauty of the Chaldees. The beauty of the Chaldees, come on. Excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and all Gomorrah. All excellency is going to be burned up. Their space program, all that's going to be destroyed. Go ahead. It shall, it shall never be inhabited, neither shall Hold it. Hold it. Th that's the point right there. When the bombs hit this place, this place is never going to be inhabited again. 
That is not Iraq. Iraq is inhabited right now. That's where ancient Babylon was. Read that 20th verse again. Yes, sir. It shall never. So you can understand the Babylon that Isaiah was standing in. He was basically standing in Iraq. Are people over there in Iraq now? Yes. Read it. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation because it's going to be all burned up with smoke, with fire. That's how he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. That's how he's going to do this place here. Now, I'm going to jump out of sequence a little bit because I want to end, I want to end it on the right note. Uh, where are you reading that? Isaiah 13, 20. Read 21. Verse, you want to finish out? 20? Yes, sir. Finish 20 and 21. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in. And I got a lot of good stuff that I didn't even give y'all yet. Damn. Good stuff. Read on. I from can't do it today, though. <laughs> from, uh, gener read. from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So you, you have some people that was trying to say that Babylon was over there, but we're going to prove that it ain't. Well, as we keep reading, and when I read this next scripture, it's going to prove that it's talking about right you know, Read. But while beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful, doleful creatures, doleful creatures, creatures and, and owls shall dwell there, and, and the satires shall dance there. In other words, no, no human life going to be able, it's only going to be like little owls and all that. That's it. That's what this place is going to be like, like the day after. That's how this place is going to be, if anybody ever saw that movie. That's how this place is going to be. No life going to be able to live here at all. Uh, uh, Revelation 18, the same, we're going to read the exact same thing. Revelation 18, you know this ain't talking about ancient Babylon when we're reading the Revelation now. Revelation 18, 1. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 1. Let's go. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power. And the earth was lighted with his glory. And the earth was lighted with his glory, with the glory of the Most High. Go ahead. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the Great is fallen. I told you that what we was reading in Isaiah was about Babylon the Great. That's where we at. Where the children of Israel have been laying here dead. Like Revelation 11, the 8th chapter, and the Israelites, it says, and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. That's where we at now. Read that again. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Babylon the great is fallen. Go ahead. Is fallen. Is fallen. Come on. And it's become the habitation of devils. And it's become the habitation of devils. Come on. And the hold of every foul spirit. Every foul spirit. And that's, what, that's what this place is, foul spirits and, and demonic mess is all over here, Christianity and all that. But it's going to show you what it's really talking about. Keep reading. In a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's what we just read in uh, Isaiah, unclean and hateful bird. Go back to Isaiah uh, 13 and 21. This is what this is, co this is correlating with that. Isaiah 13 and 21. But while every unclean and hateful bird is what the 21st verse of Isaiah 13 is talking about. So Isaiah was prophesying, connecting with what John was writing about. Read. Isaiah chapter 13 and verse 21. Read. But while beasts of the desert shall lie there. Come on. And their houses shall be full of doleful creatures. Go ahead. And owls shall dwell there. And satries shall dance there. And so basically buzzards. That's what it's talking about. Basically, buzzards and old owls and stuff like that. Revelation 18, where you was at again? The Re second verse. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Go ahead. It's fallen. Mm -hmm. And it's become the habitation of devils. Read. And, and the hold of every foul spirit. And a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's this place here. Every unclean and hateful bird. That's that owl that's that uh, doleful creatures, uh, what is that, wild beasts. Oh, that's what's just going to be left here. Uh, basically a wasteland. That's why Isaiah 13 said what it said, to destroy the whole land. Okay. Uh, read on. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Go ahead. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. 
And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. That's what made her the glory of kingdoms. That's what it said in Isaiah where it says the beauty of the Chaldees. That's what it's talking about because she took everybody else's riches. There's so many ways that I can go with the scripture here. I used to teach this a lot of times in the old school. Go through all kind of pro, showing you all kinds of vivid, vivid information about how this place is going to be destroyed. Clearly, I'm just going to give you just a glimpse of it in the next couple of minutes. Uh, read. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. That means come out of the mindset that I was telling y'all early. We got to be in pain and labor to get out of that slave mindset because if we don't, we're going to die here. When the Lord sets this place on fire, if, if our minds ain't right, you're going to die here with your enemies. Y'all better repent. Our brothers and sisters better get their minds right because the Lord is not playing. He's going to set this place on fire. I'm going to prove that. I'm going to prove that. Give me, now jump down. Give me Isaiah 13. I mean, Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. And one. We're going to read to show you that it's talking about the white man clearly. <clears throat> and I have my pictures and all that. I'm, the next time I'm going to have to go through this some more because I got the pictures and everything to prove what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. I ain't even hit none of this. Look at all this information here. I ain't even get to none of this yet. Go ahead. Come on. Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 1. Come near, ye nations, to hear, and hearken, ye people. Let the earth hear, and all that is therein, the world and all things that come forth of it. The Most High wants us to hear something. Come on. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations. That's why he says in Obadiah, for the, lay of, for the day of the Lord is upon the nations. Go ahead. And his fury upon all their armies. And his fury is upon all the armies. Whose armies mainly? The white man's armies. Negro ain't got no army. What the hell are we talking about? Go ahead. He have utterly destroyed them. He, this is a past tense. He has utterly destroyed. He's showing you the aftermath. He had utterly destroyed their armies. Go ahead. He have Isaiah is seeing that, uh, that he's seeing that Babylon the Great is destroyed. That's what we're reading about. He's already, he's writing what he's already seen already happen. He had utterly destroyed them. They're already destroyed. Isaiah's writing it down. Read. He have utterly destroyed, destroyed them. Go ahead. He have delivered them to the slaughter. He have delivered them to the slaughter. Read. Their, their slain also shall be cast out. Go ahead. And their stink shall come up out of their carcasses. Can you imagine, can you imagine what this place is going to be like with a bunch of dead bodies burn up? Ain't nobody gonna be able to. Ain't nobody gonna be able to live here. Read. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And the mountains shall be melted with their blood. Lord have mercy. Read. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. This is the war in the heaven part. That's why I want to get to this real quick. And there shall be what? And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved. It ain't talking about God's heavens. It's talking about this white man's heaven. When you read in the book of Peter, it explains it. That's why I say I got a lot more to go through. It says, and the host of heaven shall be dissolved, meaning the white man's heavens, meaning his kingdoms. We're in hell. The white man is in heaven. Read. And the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. And the heavens shall. Can I get a mushroom cloud, please, so they can see what this is talking about? Can I get one to show on the screen? I didn't see y'all any of those pictures. No bombs or nothing. Let's, just, let's get an idea of what it said. And the heavens and all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Let's look at it. Zoom that in. Open that up. This is what it's talking about. Isaiah saw this. Show it to him. This is what Isaiah is talking about. And the heavens, meaning their kingdom, is going to be rolled up like this when a bomb hit it. Rolled up like a scroll. Read. Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. Come on. And all their hosts shall fall down. And all their armies, their navies, all of that, all of their weapons, all that is going to be destroyed in that day when Christ come back. Go ahead. All their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine. That's how easy it is going to be for the Lord to destroy this whole system. It's going to be as easy as a leaf falling off of a tree. That's the kind of power Christ is coming back. He said, I'm not coming back as a man. I'm coming back with full power. Even those that pierced me, they're going to see me. That's going to be a, they're going to be shaken with terrible fear. And in one hour, this is going to be all gone. Right. 
Just think about that. One, one, one moment we're here and, and slaving. What's that song that OSZ did? Slaving. We, one hour we're here, the next hour this is all gone. Right. That's how quick the Lord going to get rid of the 60 minutes. Boom, this is over with. That's the power that he's coming with. Uh, where we at? Read on. And as a fallen fig from the fig tree, for my sword shall be bathed in heaven. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Is it talking about the most high heavens? No. The heavens that God is going to bathe his sword in, because it tells you in the scriptures, he cometh with a sharp sword, and with it he shall smite the nations. So what, what heavens is he talking about bathing his sword in? The white man's. It's going to prove it with this next scripture. Him, particularly, because he got the weapons. Read it. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumia. Behold, the sword of God shall come down upon Idumia. The Idumians is the so-called white man. That's the Greek word for the name Edom, particularly the so-called Jews. Okay? All of this is coming down on them, and it's coming down on all the so-called white man. Idumia. Who does not know what the word Idumia means? Hands up. Who does not know? So everybody knows? I didn't see any hands. If y'all going to put the hands up, can we put it up on the board, please? Idumian. Of or relating to Edom or, or the relating Edomites. Relating to Edom. Relating to Edom. 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 Give me my pictures. I got to throw one in there. Give me the book Jewish Civilization. Now I'm going to prove that Edom is the white man. And God's sword is against him. See that? Show that? Pictorial History of Jewish Civilization. Very prestigious book. I have it up here. But I'm glad I got it on the picture. I'm, so we can show you some insides to this here. This is a book that I'm talking about. Okay? Let's open up the book. Okay? That, this right here, now I can talk about this later. This shows you that these Edomites, because this is in this book. Hold it, hold it. Wait. Let me show this. Inside this book here, you ain't got to move. I got a whole lot of stuff written. This, I had this book during the time of One West, so you see a whole lot of, you know, you see uh, uh, the lines of Israel camp, sons of Yahweh and all that. That was, this was back at the old school, so I had this book for that long. But at the other part of it, I just want to show where it got that writing in it, and this is what I blew it up on the screen. Let's go back to what's on the screen. Dear De Seth. Yeah, dear Seth, go ahead. Best wishes to you on this special day. So these are white people. I bought, we, me and Bishop used to go to this bookstore in New York, Strand's bookstore, 12th, 12th Street and Broadway, where they got all these old books that, that these scholars would uh, send their uh, books to, use books, they all be in there. We used to go in there and buy everything. Me, a, me Deacon Asaph, we just, just go in there and spend our money. Hey, we didn't spend our money on no damn rims and sneakers and all that. We bought books. <laughs> Y'all all right? Books like this here. Best wishes to you on this special day. Raymond Montana. So this was a gift. So they're passing these books backwards and forwards to each other. Meanwhile, the poor little Negro don't know what the hell is going on. So let's see what they let's see what they were passing backwards and forward. Go inside the book. Show that picture. Let's show it all. Get that. Show that. This is the inside of the book. Picture history of Jewish civilization. Uh, caught, uh, chart well books incorporated. Okay. Go to the next page. Okay. This is what I wanted to show earlier, but I ain't had time to go into this. Picture history of Jewish civilization. Look at the pictures here. These are, can you read what's on the bottom of that? Yes, sir. What did it say? Read that. Page 12. The thousands of war captives who were transformed into slaves made it possible for the Egyptian kings to implement their feats of engineering. Go ahead. Chained captives. That's the word I want y'all to see. What? Chained captives. Can you zoom in on those words? Can we going to see the chained captives? What? Are shown on these painted clay facing plaques from a building erected by Ramses II. Ramses II was the king that was in charge when the Israelites was in bondage. So go back to the picture of these lying bastards, so-called white people, with this bull crap talking about the day of the Jews. Look at the people that's on the walls erected from a building from Ramses II. They got this from their walls. Chained captives. Who are the captives? The Israelites. Look at the facial features on these people. Look at the brown color on the face. That's a woman. Look on the other side. 
Move the camera over. Zoom in so they can see the yokes of iron. There, I want to get it all up. Look at the yoke of iron around the neck. You see it. Can y'all see? This is not a comic book that you're looking at. This picture is a thousands years old. Thousands of years old. BC. From the from the from the from the walls from Ramses' time. From the building that was built, we built that. And it had color on them, as you can see. Go back to the writing again. So this is not a comic book that we're looking at. Look at that. The thousands of war captives who were transformed into slaves made it possible for the Egyptian kings to implement their feats of engineering. Chain captives are shown on these painted clay facing plaques from a building erected by Ramses so II. So the so-called white man knows this. From a building erected by Ramses II. That was the king that was in charge when we was in slavery. That was the king that we came out of captivity under. Y'all all, all right? So we're looking at history like that man said. We, don't, we need to have this history burned in our brain. Move to the other side. And y'all see, look at the skin. Look at her face. And look at the blouse that she's wearing. That is not a white woman. Can y'all see that? Can y'all see that? I know, it's, I know people are shocked right now with their lying selves. That's our people that was in Egyptian bondage. That's what you're looking at. So, God, right, we can come out of this. Now I want to get to why I went to this book. Okay? There's a lot of information in here. I'm going to bring that out on another day. Just leave, leave some. This is on page 94 in the same book. We will reread that in uh, Isaiah again, and it shall come down upon Idumea. Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 5. Stay with me, brothers, sisters. Stay with me. Read it. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. It shall come, the sword of God shall come down upon Idumea. Go ahead. And upon the people of my curse to judge what is the What is the people of God's curse? Esau. What is the curse? Not only the leprosy, but mainly that they're going to be destroyed. The, the curse that the Lord put on these people is that they are the vessels of God's wrath. That's why he created them. Let me say that again. They have no other purpose but to show for, for them to fight against God and for God to exercise his power in destroying them. That's the, he cursed them to be the vessels of God's wrath. Somebody give me that in Romans 9 to show you what the curse is some more. I ain't done. I'm proving it that this is them. Romans chapter 9 and verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? Who are we reading about? Esau. That's what this, this what we're reading here is about Esau. It, the, Esau is in, the, is in verse 22. Jacob is in verse 23. Read it again. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known. And God wants to make his power known. How is God going to show his power off? This is how. Read. Endured with much long suffering. He endured with much long suffering watching this white man running around calling himself a Jew, disregarding the real Jews and all that. He's seeing this and God knows that this man is a liar. But God made him that way. Read. The vessels of wrath. God calls him the vessels of wrath. A vessel is something that you channel liquid through or you channel something through. The Most High is going to channel his anger through the vessel of the white people. Go ahead. The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. God said that he was made to be destroyed. That's what fitted to destruction means. He was made to be destroyed. That's his purpose. That's the curse that God gave him. He, he made him to be the vessel of God's destruction. I'm going to show my power by destroying you. That's the reason why he said, even for the same purpose, have I raised thee up like he did in the time of Pharaoh. He raised up Pharaoh so that he could channel his power through him. He said the same thing to Esau. He said, for the, even for the same purpose, have I raised thee up that I might show my power in you when I destroy you. That's what he's saying. Read. Verse 23. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. That's Jacob. That's the Israelites. He's going to make known his riches upon the mercies to the vessels of mercy. We are the, vessel, we are the vessels of God's mercy. Esau is the vessel of God's wrath. That's what we're reading. Okay? So now let's go back to Isaiah. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. 
Isaiah chapter 34 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. For my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Go ahead. Behold, it shall come down upon Idumea. It shall come down upon Idumea. Hold, get, y'all got Esau, y'all got Edom, uh, Idumea, right? Hold on to that. Read on. And upon the people of my curse to judgment. The curse is the Most High is going to bring that destruction through them because they are the vessel of God's wrath. Go ahead. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. The sword of the Lord is filled with the white man's blood in his heavens. Go ahead. It is made fat with fatness. Meaning it's going to be a lot of blood on that sword. Go ahead. And with the blood of lambs and goats. Go ahead. With the fat of the kidneys of, of rams. For the Lord have a sacrifice in Basra. For the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. That's another word. Basra was the capital of Edom. When you check the history out. Basra was the capital of Edom. Go ahead. For the Lord have a sacrifice in Basra. And a great slaughter. And a great slaughter. In the land of Idumea. In the land of Idumea. The land of Idumea is America. That's what it's talking about. Now. Now. Put up the thing. Put up the put up the thing in um by Idumia. We're gonna come back to this right. Let them see what Idumia means. Idumian. Of or Zoom related it in to so they can see it because somebody might claim that they got stigmatism. They can't see. <laughs> Idumian. <laughs> of or relating to Edom or relating the Edomites. Relating to Edom or the Edomites. Do y'all see that? Yes, sir. Didn't y'all see that? So who are we talking about? Edom. Who's Edom? Let's go to the Jewish uh, Jewish civilization, this book, page 94. And we're going to read what it says in there, page 94, that page that we had earlier. Let's read, jump down to the part where it says, Lord of the universe. Yes, sir. Right where you got your fingers at. Lord of the universe. Go ahead. Is it not enough for your sons what the evil kingdom of Edom, Rome, did to them? Whoa. Edom who? Edom, Rome, Rome did to them? is the whole white world. Greco-Roman Empire. That's the so-called white man. What Edom, Rome did to them? Go ahead. That you must also send the kingdom of Ishmael against us? Now jump down. Where I got that, where I got the parentheses at. He? He, he sets a prophet of his choice over them who will co conquer the land of Israel Go ahead. for them. Go ahead. And, and they will come this, go ahead, here and come. restore it to the Jews. Now listen to what they have written in this Jewish uh, civilization book that a Negro was not supposed to have. You have Seth passing it to Raymond, Raymond passing it back to Seth. A Negro was never supposed to get his hands on it. And they're reading this stuff. They know that these are the people. They know that this is them. Read it. What does it say? And, and there, there will, will be a great hatred between them and the children of Esau Rome. Did y'all see that? And the children of Esau, Rome, which are the Idumeans. And my sword shall be bathed in Idumea, which is Babylon the Great, right here. Right here. Isaiah 9 and 5. I got to read the, uh, uh, Revelation 12. Let me read that scripture. Revelation 12 and 7, then Isaiah 9 and 5. I'm almost done. Revelations chapter 12 and verse 7. And there, was, and there was war in heaven. And there was war in heaven. I cut out a lot just to end this part section of the class. There's a lot that I skipped. And there was war in heaven because I'm, I'm still not done with Micah. I didn't even get close to getting done yet. I only went two lines, two words. I ain't even dealt with the rest of the verse yet. But we're going back there the next time I teach. Y'all all right? Yes, sir. Read. And there was war in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Come on. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon is the so-called white man. The dragon is a great red dragon with seven heads, which started with the Greeks, then the, then the Romans, then the uh, French. Uh, <laughs> get my names again. Uh, Greece, Rome, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, and Britain. Those are the seven heads. I had to think about it. I had to think about the order. Y'all got me? Yes, sir. Greece, Rome, uh, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, and Britain. Those are the seven heads. All of those are white people. Read on. And there was war in heaven. And there was war in heaven. Go ahead. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon with the seven heads and the ten horns. Go ahead. And the dragon fought in his, 
and his angels. So you can understand those seven heads, out of the seventh head came an eighth head. That's recorded in the 17th chapter. That eighth head was America, and it, said, and it shall go into destruction, which is what the word perdition means. Revelation 17, give me that. Revelation 17 real quick. Revelation 17, verse 5. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. Mystery. That's the first name that was up there. Meaning people don't know where Babylon the Great is. They're acting like they don't know. Because it's a mystery. They're thinking it's in Iraq. They think it's here. They think it's there. No, it's a mystery because they're trying to figure out where is this place at. It's here. That's where, that's where it's at now. Mystery. And it's Babylon the Great. Great confusion. Man don't even know if he's a man or not. Read. The mother of harlots. The mother of whores. The mother of harlots. America sleeps with every nation in their politics. This is deep. Makes them all get in bed with her. With their democracy. Read on. The mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The homosexuals, lesbians, all that's abominations. This is the land of abominations right here. Read on. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. And with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That's the prophets. They're going to kill a lot of us. That's what the Most High said. A lot of our people got killed in this country. And they ain't done yet. But the Most High said, I got you. We ain't worrying about it. Read on. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? Why are you marveling, John? I'm going to show you what's happening. Because he, John is actually seeing all of this go down. He's seeing it. And he's needs, I need some explanations. I see a, a scarlet colored beast with seven heads. and I need some help. Explain this to me. Go ahead. I will tell thee the mystery of the woman. I will tell you the woman. And of the beast that carrieth her. And I will tell you about the seven heads that carries her. Which have the seven heads. Which have the seven heads. I named them for you early. Which have the seven heads. Go ahead. And ten horns. And the ten horns of ten common markets. Read. The beast that thou sawest the was. The beast that thou sawest, John. Was. Was. And, and is not. Was in your vision, John, but it is not in existence. During the time that John was writing that, America did not exist. Y'all hear me? Yes, sir. America was not in existence. It was in your vision, John, but it was not in existence yet. Read. And shall ascend out of the bo bottomless pit. Bottomless pit is Europe. And when it said, and, and this, this Babylon that you saw shall ascend out of Europe. The Britain, so you can understand. It came out of Britain. Read. And go into perdition. And when it comes, it shall go into destruction. That's where we're at now. The bombs is going to hit it. Read. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Whose names were not written in and the, the book. And the people shall be on the earth and they shall wonder whose names is not written in the what? In the book of life from the foundation. America is not written in the Bible because America did not exist. It's spiritually recorded, but as a physical place, it did not exist. Read that statement again. Whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Whose names was not written in the book of life, the Bible, from the foundation of the world because America as a place did not exist. It existed in spirit. That's the reason why John was able to write about it. Read on. When they behold the beast. When they, at, when they behold this beast that John saw in his mind, that, that he saw in his vision. Go ahead. That was. That was in your vision, John. And is not. But it is not in existence yet. Go ahead. And yet is. And yet it is coming. Go ahead. And here is the mind which have wisdom. And here is the mind that has wisdom. Go ahead. The seven heads are seven mountains. The seven heads are seven governments. I named it for you earlier. Greece, Rome, uh, Spain, France, Germany, Russia, and Britain. Go ahead. On which the woman sitteth. On which the woman sitteth. Go ahead. And there are seven kings. And there are seven kings. It's crystal clear what it's talking about. The red kings, the re all of the names that I gave is red people, which is the so-called white man. He's not white. He's never been white. He's always been red. That's why it's called the red dragon. Right. Read. And there are seven kings. And there are seven kings. Listen. Five, five are fallen. Five of those kings have fallen. And one is. The one is is the one that John was in, which was Rome. And the, the other five had fallen. So all of them had fell except Rome, which was the one that he was in, and Britain. That's the other one that it's going to name. Go ahead. And the other is not yet. And the other one is not yet. That's Britain. 
Go ahead. And the other is not yet come. And the other is not yet come. That's Britain. Go ahead. And when he cometh. And when he cometh. He must continue a short space. He must continue a short space because America broke off from Britain. Read. And the beast that was. And the beast that you saw in your, in, in your vision, John. And is not. And is not yet in your time, John. Even he is the eighth. Even he is the eighth. And is of the seven. America came out of the came out of Britain, and which came out of the other seven heads, which is of the seven. Go ahead. And goeth into perdition. And goeth into destruction. The bombs. And my sword shall be bathed in heaven. That's the reason why we're waking up now, because we're in that time. And shall go into perdition, which means destruction. You'll see that? Now, that's it on that, right? Yes, sir. Okay, now. Two scriptures, then we out. <laughs> Isaiah 9 and 5. Because I'm going to prove that it's talking about nuclear destruction Do it real quick. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 5. Listen. I, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 5. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise. For every battle of the war, the wars that's fought on this planet is with confused noise. These are the wars that's, prior, that's before the nuclear wars that we have now. So the, f the wars that was before is the fighting in the trenches with the swords, bayonets in the lungs, heads chopped off, arms chopped off, confused noise. Read it again. For every battle of the warrior. For every war. Is with confused noise. Is with confused noise. Ah, I'm dying. That's what it's talking about, confused noise, people screaming. Go ahead. And garments rolled in blood. And garments rolled in blood when they got stabbed with the bayonets in the lungs and the heads chopped off and legs missing. And their bloody garments wrapped around them when they carrying them on the gurneys. Read. But. But. Listen. This. But this war. Now. It's going to be what? Shall be with burning and fuel of fire. Did y'all hear that? The wars that's coming up after that is going to be with burning and fuel of fire. That's nuclear missiles. Right. Who's writing this? Isaiah. Whose words that he's bringing? The Most High. With burning and fuel of fire. Give me Malachi 4 and 1. Malachi 4 and 1. Now I want something before that. Isaiah 54 and 16. I want that one. Isaiah, then I want Malachi. Shake y'all up a little bit. Damn, it's coming on 9.30. They're going to get me. Deacon's cursing me out right now. I got to wind it down. Come on. His announcement's going to be short, right? <laughs> they got a lot of them? Oh, Lord have mercy. Come on now. Isaiah, chapter, <laughs> chapter 54 and verse 16. Behold, I have created the smith. That bloweth the coals in the fire. God says, behold, I have created the blacksmith. I'm going to break it down so we don't take so long. God said, I created the blacksmith, which is a man that makes weapons. I have created the blacksmith that bloweth the coals in the fire, because that's what they did. Made the fire big so that they can bend steel to make shields, bucklers, swords, helmets. That's what a blacksmith did, made weapons for war. Can I get a witness? Yes, sir. Read. And that bringeth forth an instrument. And he also caused this smith to bring forth an instrument for, for war. Go ahead. For his work. For God's work. Let's find out what this instrument is. Read. And I have created the waster. I have created the waster. To destroy. To destroy the whole land like we read in Isaiah. The waster is going to destroy the whole land. The waster is a nuclear bomb. The prophets didn't even really know what to call it. They see it in their mind, and it's just a, it's a waster. Hell, I don't know what else, I don't know how to describe this. It's a waster because when it hit, everything was gone. Malachi four and one. Malachi chapter four and verse one. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. The day cometh. This is Malachi trying to describe the part of his part of this destruction. Malachi says, "Behold, the day cometh that shall what." Burn as an oven. What day has it ever been on this earth where it felt like you was in an oven? For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. On full blast, there's going to be a day that's going to be feeling like you inside an oven. What kind of weapon back then produced anything like that? Nothing. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. That's what Malachi is being shown. 
war in heaven. Read. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Come on. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. The people going to be burned up like we was reading earlier. Their carcasses and their stinks are going to rise up. Read. And the day that cometh shall burn them up. And that day that feels like an oven is going to burn them up. Go ahead. Saith the Lord of hosts. Saith the Lord of hosts. That it shall leave them neither root nor branch. That it shall leave them neither root nor branch, meaning all of the trees and everything. This is, there's so many scriptures in the Bible that clearly points this out. I'm just showing you just a very few. It shall leave them neither root or branch. The trees, everything going to get burned up. Revelation, the seventh chapter, talks about that. The wind of destruction said that the angels were holding back the wind until the 12 tribes of Israel returned to the Most High. Then it says, let it loose until the servants of God has been sealed in their foreheads. It said, hold back the wind that the, that the wind shall not blow on any tree. That the wind was the wind of destruction because regular wind blow every day. So the wind that it was talking about in Revelation is what we read in here. That day that should feel like an oven. That it on that, right? Yes, sir. Give me Zechariah. That's the last scripture. <laughs> Zechariah 14 and 12. Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 12. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. That's the so-called Jews. That's the so-called Negroes. That's about, that's about everybody that was fighting this gospel. Every nooker that turned their back on this com uh, Turned their back on this gospel is talking about them too. Turn coats and all of them. Everybody that turned their that turned their backs on this gospel, right? And and tried to destroy it. They gonna pay too. Read that again. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. If you are found to be fighting against this truth, this is gonna be your fate. Read. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. So let's add up what we've been reading. It said, for this war shall be with, with burning and fuel of fire. The other prophets said that it shall be like a day that feels like an oven. The other prophets said that, that this is a waster. The other scriptures said that it shall destroy the whole land mm. and the weapons of God's indignation to destroy the whole land with a D singular. Now we're reading the effects of the heat. Read it again. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. What can make your flesh evaporate from your bones before your bones react to gravity to pull your skeleton to the ground? Your flesh is gone before your body has a chance to react to gravity. Read it again. Yes, sir. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. I mean, the next part is what I want you to repeat. Their flesh shall consume away. What's going to make your flesh consume away? While they, while they stand upon their feet. While your bones, while your body is still standing. By the time your by the time your by the time your body, by the time your skeleton hits the ground, all of the flesh off of your bones is going to be evaporated because of that heat. Their flesh, read it again. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. Go ahead. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes. And your eyes are going to melt in your sockets. That's twofold. Your eyes are literally going to melt in your sockets. Plus, your vision of going beyond what the Most High said is going to end, that's going to be closed. You ain't going to be talking about some what you're going to be doing after that. After that, you're going to be dead. Read. And their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And their tongue is all that talking philosophy about what Esau is going to continue to do. All that's going to be closed in that day. But it's literally going to melt in his mouth because the heat going to burn it up. Y'all see this? This is crystal clear. This is beautiful. All praise to the Most High. Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is women's support. Nation is children with role models.